We've gathered glitches from every single Halo game, leaving no stone unturned in an attempt to make an ultimate Halo glitches video. We've been glitch hunting for years on this channel, and have made so many videos covering the glitches, but we haven't had one single place where you can experience everything that we have explored. So prepare to witness the unexpected as we showcase some of the mind-bending anomalies, jaw-dropping, physics-defying stunts, and maybe some glitches that will leave you scratching your head in awe. And don't worry, there's some classic glitches that we know you all will appreciate in this video as well. And there's a ton of new stuff that we've never covered before exclusively put into this video. Now just for the way that we did our research, we're going to be going ahead and putting this video together in timeline chronological order. So if there's a specific game you want to take a look at, use the chapter function down below. But otherwise, let's go ahead and get things started with Halo Reach. Halo Reach initially released in 2010 for the Xbox 360 and it was bundled Bungie's final hurrah with the franchise Halo, and Halo Reach was interesting for a while. It actually was the only Halo game of the main FPS franchise series, at least for a while, not to be featured in the Master Chief Collection. It later would be added into MCC, but it was definitely years after MCC's initial launch, and what that ends up causing is in Halo Reach, there's actually some glitches that only can be done on the original Xbox 360 version, and other glitches that only came up during the... MCC port, which upped the frame rate to 60 frames per second and made the resolution better. So we'll have a bit of both of those in this section. So let's jump into Halo Reach here. On Winter Contingency, there's this pointless out of bounds area that's just over by the cliffs that you can get to by jumping over some rocks. You can fly the Falcon by plasma pistoling the friendly Falcon that's in the air, causing it to flip over and then quickly get inside the Falcon. This then enables you to skip ahead in the level and really start to just break random things. While the glitch itself is impressive, you can also then clip it into this spirit and break out of bounds of the map, giving you full access to explore everything. You can even take the Falcon over to where you're actually supposed to go if you want to. Towards the end of the level, when you're in the little firefight and you're holding out for the door to close, for whatever reason, one time I was playing this, getting footage for something else, and Emil just walked into me and pressure launched me into the wall, splattering me. I had footage of this for the longest time, and I don't know what happened to it. I must have lost it, so you're just gonna have to take my word on it that this happened. But yeah, whatever happened, Emil was walking into the room and he hit my Spartan and I hit the wall or something and just instantly died. I'm pretty upset about losing the footage here. I replaced it with Rainbow Six footage, I think, on my Xbox DVR. So I'm just gonna have to hope that you guys believe me. During that same firefight section, you can actually run outside where all of the action is going and jump into this little corner and you can get yourself stuck here. Yeah, there's not too much to it, but you can get yourself stuck. Also, there's this friendly elite glitch that General Kid managed to do, which is pretty awesome. You have to do the hijacked Falcon glitch to set this one up and then kind of trick the elites into hijacking you, but it is just funny to see what it looks like. On sword base, if you are good at jumping and you can get some careful leaps off without falling to your death, you can actually break outside of the map here and get on the outside wall of the map. And this one's just kind of fun in general. Also, we've learned this in an interesting way. If you get to the hunters too quickly in this level, you can actually cause them to end up being invincible, which you know, that's never good. And then this next one, we weren't sure if it actually should count or not, but there is a farming spot that you could use for XP back in the original 360 days where you could grab the target designator and just keep triggering the enemies right behind you with it. And you could just rack up a ton of killing medals, which would then translate into a lot of XP and match bonuses in the 360 days of ranking up. Now they eventually put a hard cap on that where you couldn't rank up too much more, but it was really great for getting a lot of bonuses right away for a little while until it did cut you off. Over on Nightfall, there's that infamous glitch where you can clip through this door by using a good old forklift, and if you do it fast enough, it'll actually despawn all of the enemies in this section, making running to the end of the level really easy. If you slide off of a rock just right and you armor lock on top of June's head, you can actually force June to like move really quickly, and it does this kind of speedy bump launch thing across the map. Speedrunners have been 
able to do it occasionally and it's pretty amazing. Once you get out of bounds, if you're fast enough, you can jump onto this phantom right here. And if you armor lock through a barrier that typically would cut you off, you get access to the outside sections of this level and you have full reign to just go on and fully explore. If you travel far enough up the river, you can actually find the Banshee that was in the cutscene at the beginning, just kind of here, randomly outside of the map, which you then can go ahead and fly. Also, when we're playing through Halo Reach Piggyback, which is an awesome video if you haven't seen it, we found out that there is a weird glitch where one player, typically either the host player, is sticky, where the other player on top can stand on top of the head of the player. However, if the sticky player is standing on top, he will slide off of the other player. It's really weird and inconsistent. We don't really know how it works. And for whatever reason, if one of us died, then either the other player would be sticky or none of us would be sticky and we couldn't even stand on each other's heads. We investigated it a little bit in the video, so make sure you check that out if you're ever curious about what is going on here. Also, there's this glitch where you can make the Guta do a backflip. Tip of the Spear is another fun map to break out and just explore. First of all, you can get outside of the map by these rocks by doing a couple of tricks with a warthog and a concussion rifle and just kind of force its way out. If you can hit everything correctly and get a checkpoint that lets you actually survive outside this area without springing you back in, you can travel yourself all the way down to see all of these warthogs that are supposed to be way out in the distance. And as it turns out, they're not just far away warthogs. They're actually just really tiny, which is a cool force perspective type thing that they did here. There's also this really awesome warthog launch that you can do over here that springs you up in the sky. This one was shown by our friend Tepic from Halo Creation, the greatest Halo French community that's out there. And yeah, it's pretty cool just to be able to launch yourself up. You can eventually launch yourself high enough to even land on that giant ship up there, which is awesome. Also on tip of the spear, if you get a warthog out of bounds and you drive it meticulously into the right area where you can then get it on top of this pelican that drops a bridge. If two people stay at the warthog and one person goes ahead in the level, causing the next section of the level to load in, the pelican will despawn, causing the warthog to do this mega mint blitz-like launch, and it's pretty hilarious. I felt so cool doing this. This next one's not as epic, but if you jump over this thing, there's a little shortcut here to skip going across the bridge. And taking it a step further, you can actually run on top of these little railings and get up here, bypassing this first little hallway you have to go through. And then from there, you can either drop down and continue through the level normally, or you can do an amazing parkour jump all the way across and skip another big section. I tried it and I fell. There's a really awesome glitch that speedrunners have been able to occasionally pull off to bypass the entire on rails section of the Falcon ride. Essentially, if you use a Revenant to push a Falcon and get it stuck by a tree and then bait two elites to pull off a double hijack on the Falcon, where you then have to kill the one that's in the turret and then get the other one that's still hijacking the pilot by jumping out of the turret. If you hijack the elite from the driver's seat, you can then be in control of the Falcon. It's very complicated. It is not a very easy thing to pull off. But if you do it right, you can fly to the top of the spire as long as you hit all the loading sequences in order, which is much faster. The only problem is after you've done all of that, you've managed to have this amazing luck where you were able to do all of that. To get out of the Falcon, you have to be hijacked like the door doesn't work or something normally. So you have to hopefully bait another elite to come out and hijack you so you can actually get out and then finish the level. Still a really interesting glitch nonetheless. There also is another way you can glitch out of the map in the end area by the spear itself where you can get out of bounds utilizing a Banshee, which is pretty cool too. On Long Night of Solace, if you duck underwater, the enemies can't see you for whatever reason. Okay, so there's this really cool glitch on Long Night of Solace that you can do on the original Xbox 360 version of Halo Reach, but essentially if you come over to where this pelican is in the first section of the level and you get on top of it, you can armor lock your way way outside of the map and get over by this rock. You don't have to do a lot of walking and parkour and fortunately General Kid has a really good video on his channel where he pulls this stuff off and I've never been able to do this glitch myself because of how intensively, incredibly hard it looks, but nonetheless, if you go over on top of this pillar and you time your plasma pistol shot just perfectly, there's a seraph that flies overhead, which you can then knock out of the sky. And then from there, you have to travel all the way over to wherever it landed or stopped landing. And you'll notice it's like super miniature in size. And from there, you have to get your lineup just perfectly right. And you can actually somehow manage to jump inside of the Seraph. I don't know, this one's crazy to me, but fortunately enough, they added the Seraph into Halo Reach Forge. So we can just 
fly it that way instead. Later on in the level, when you are flying in with the ships around you, you can actually glitch the game and just leap out if you respawn and quickly hold down your exit vehicle button and just fall out of your ship to your death. This one's really funny because if you do it enough and you just infinitely keep jumping out of your vehicle over and over and over again, you'll end up overloading the game and you can eventually cause your game to completely crash, something we did in a video. You can also block various entrances in this room with the boxes that are around and it'll make it so when you have to travel back through this level and you're doing your backtracking, the enemies won't respawn, making getting through this section a little bit easier. Also in the final firefight section, for whatever reason, you can actually hold the enter vehicle button down by the base of this pelican if you're clipping your head through it and boom, all of a sudden you're inside of the turret gunner seat of the pelican where you can then just shoot at all of the enemies. It's definitely not supposed to happen, but hey, here we are. Going on Exodus, you can actually have a lot of fun just jumping around and seeing what areas you can get into by avoiding soft kill barriers. Like for instance, in this first open area, you're able to get down below, and if you run into this corner for whatever reason, the soft kill barrier will shut off, giving you more time to run around and try to find another safe area to stand. And there's quite a few areas you can surprisingly stand in where the game won't kill you. On Exodus, when you get a jetpack, there's a lot of little areas you can fly around to and explore, and if you keep the jetpack with you, you can just kind of go places and that's cool. On Exodus, there's a series of glitches you can do that give you access to a lot of different areas that you normally wouldn't get to see. For instance, after your Falcon ride, if you do a gravity hammer launch with some skulls on, you can knock this warthog all the way across the riverbed and get it landed right over on the opposite side, which you can then use later on. Then in this section where a Falcon comes in, if you've brought armor lock with you from earlier in the level, when the Falcon is getting ready to leave, you can pull off an armor lock to make it a little bit further out of bounds, and from there you can actually drop in on the outside section of this level and not get killed. From there, there's all sorts of weird glitches that you can experience. For instance, there's this area that looks like Terminal from Modern Warfare 2. You can go and get that warthog that you launched over earlier and explore some areas. You can find this random tree that's underwater, and in general, just a cool area to explore. Also on Exodus, if you're jetpacking around, and you do enough extra glitches, you can make your way to this pelican that you're not supposed to normally get to. And then from there, you can actually sit inside of the pelican. There's not much more going on, but you can sit in it. Towards the end of the level, you can also go around the backside of the beach. And if you have a jetpack, you can actually fly past where the soft kill barrier is and you get full access to this back area if you're careful and don't die in the water. From there, you can run around on the beach, you can climb up and look at some picnic tables and other areas, and you can even go and float on the water because the water is just like awkwardly settled there, and that's kind of cool. On New Alexandria, there is a couple of glitches you can do with the elevator if you're either standing in the wrong place or you try to clip your way through the elevator. I don't know, I've managed to have some weird stuff happen, whether it be me instantly dying or getting teleported randomly. Whenever I mess around with these elevators, you should definitely try this one out. In the one section where you're at the hospital and you have to run all the way down and hit the button to clear the jammer and then all these enemies come in and make it hard to fight your way out. If you're playing in co-op and you make your way to where you're about to press the button, if two players run out of the building before you press the button, before all those enemies spawn in, the last player can call for an evac and automatically teleport outside of the building and not have to fight all of those extra enemies, which is really incredibly helpful when you're doing something like lasso. So these aren't glitches, but they're actually Easter eggs where if you if you fly your vehicles a certain way, you essentially can get a phantom or a pelican, which you can fly. Everyone's known about this Easter egg, but what's really cool is you can then fly these vehicles way out of bounds and see like the little burnt city over here that you typically don't ever go over to. And I just thought it's cool that you get access to the entire map and nothing's gonna stop you. On the package, there's another Easter egg that turns into a glitch where if you go and quickly hit a series of switches, you can have four banshees spawn in at the beginning of the level. After you get the banshees, if you move quick enough towards the main building, you can actually trigger these falcons that spawn in and you can get inside of the falcon even though technically they're not fully loaded in yet. So they're actually shrinked down in size to make the illusion of these falcons flying in really quickly from far away instead of just 
being here and moving a couple feet. But if you do it fast enough, you can fly these tiny shrink raid falcons and it's pretty cool. Also on the package, we were just bored one day and we grabbed a ghost just to see what we could see if we tried to boost over in this direction. And while there isn't too much you can actually do outside of the map here before the soft kill barrier just murders you, we did find a couple of rocks that we could stand on and that felt like an achievement in itself. Maybe if we were really pro, we could keep the ghost alive long enough and boost it up some rocks and find some new areas. But every time we tried that, we just died. So this is as far as we got, but still, nonetheless, we we're kind of proud of it. On the package, if you bring a concussion rifle with you, you can actually use it to bounce your way up this area and save a little bit of time instead of having to run up these ramps. Also on the package, if you move forward and then you make your way backwards again, you can mess with the loading sequences on this level and you can have June and Emil's weapons just despawn. Instead, they just got these little finger guns going on. Also at the end of the level, there's the secret Halsey's lab room that you can get to on legendary difficulty. And typically you're not able to shoot or kill anyone. However, if one player doesn't land in that room and dies on the outside while the Easter egg is activated, they can then punch and kill their friends and their friends can respawn and punch and kill each other and that's not really how it's supposed to work, but hey. Pillar of Autumn has quite a few little areas that you can mess around with or just explore some outside of the maps area. There's this little pointless area that you can just chill out in, but hey, it's cool. There's a way that you can fly up into this little gap area and bypass certain enemies from spawning. When you're later in the level and you're having to face off against the hunters, you can bypass this whole section by just crouch jumping and smashing your face through the window. By having two players manipulate the loading zones, you can have one player stand at the top of the hill while the other player makes their way down the hill and grabs a mongoose and then teleport the player back up the hill and essentially you can be in a loop of multiple unlimited mongooses which is just hilarious. This is another one that Tepig really enjoyed doing from Halo Creation and he always just goes above and beyond with these types of easter eggs. If you punch this wall randomly an ammo crate will drop out and in the original Halo Reach if you were in two player mode and you jumped into the passenger seat of one of these trucks. There's actually no animation intact for opening the door and going and sitting down. This later was fixed in MCC for whatever reason. On the flip side, there's a weird glitch that only comes up in MCC where all of the player models or enemy models will just be a matte black color. At the end of the level, you can break out of the map and just kind of stand over here in this little pointless area. It's kind of cool. There's some room to walk around and explore. Not that much else. But on the other side of the map, you can use the tree to jump off and land on top of the pelican where you can then armor lock and glitch your way out of the map and get to see a whole lot more. You can also utilize a concussion rifle to bounce your way out of this area of the level and get up to the top area faster, making using the Mac cannon for the final section of the level much more useful until you get to the part where you have to deliver the package of keys and then you can just go back up there again. Okay, and then this next glitch is absolutely pointless. There's really no real reason that you would ever need to do this, but I wanted to talk about it because I just really enjoy it for whatever reason. In the last level of Halo Reach, Pillar of Autumn, if you don't count Lone Wolf. If you are with Emil and you're at the Mongoose here, there's this little trick you can do where you get him to let you ride a passenger right before this bridge. And for whatever reason, the way that the game is scripted, it'll just kind of yeet you over the bridge in one of the most hilarious ways. I don't know why it happens this way, but it's just something that whenever we're doing a hard challenge or something, I always just get distracted by doing for whatever reason. Also, if you didn't know, after the cutscene where Carter completely yeets himself into the scarab. You can backtrack a little bit through the game, but then there's this weird mechanic that's used to teleport you away from trying to get further backwards in the level. This is actually because the level despawns itself to save resources and loads in the later part of the level, so it doesn't want you to go back and mess with the stuff that's already been unloaded, so it keeps you away. But it's still something kind of fun you can do by climbing up on someone's head and trying to backtrack the best way that you can. And then there's this lost old footage of Emil apparently not having the skull on his visor for whatever reason. It's this weird glitch. We only were able to find it in this video where it sounds like the uploader may be in a microwave, but hey, it's a 10 year old video clip and we still have footage and for that we're really thankful.
You can actually get vehicles pretty far in this level beyond where you're supposed to take them. You can get them all the way to the final firefight section. Now Luke and I actually tried this a while back for one of the videos we were doing and it was a little bit of a pain trying to get the ghost around all of the corners and through all of the doors but if you wiggle them left and right you can actually get the ghost there and while this was all going on I actually managed to do the same exact thing but with a forklift. So we actually had a forklift and a ghost at the end of Pillar of Autumn in that little firefight area and that was good and all but it did eventually despawn them once we ended up talking to Keys. Also this one's really pointless but have you ever tried forcing a forklift inside of the elevator on Sword Base? Why not? You can do it. There's also this trick a lot of people do where they just take a vehicle with them into the little area with the hunters, which does make fighting the hunters easier. Also, did you know that there's a lot of glitches that can happen when you play Christmas Halo Reach? Yeah, it's not really an official glitch, but I just wanted to take a moment to remind you guys all that this existed. And this is something just kind of amazing in its own right. Over on Lone Wolf, there's a glitch you can do to hijack a wraith. You can also glitch theater mode if you're quick enough and you time it correctly, where you can then fly out of of the map and go all the way out to where this big ship is and there's this random little Spartan statue chilling out here. Also in co-op mode if you die first for whatever reason your helmet will just be either a default helmet or a random helmet in the cutscene not the helmet that you're actually wearing. Okay so around this point we decided to be really fun if we decided to look online and see what other glitches maybe we haven't actually taken a closer look at just yet. And we stumbled across this 11 year old general kid video which was just the best thing that I've seen all day today and he does some pretty basic glitches with some of his friends so Luke and I thought hey why don't we go and try to recreate some of these glitches and it kind of ended up being a blast so this next one's an oldie but definitely a good one if you have a plasma launcher and you're in forge you can overcharge it and shoot one of your buddies and if he quickly escapes and goes into his forge ball mode he won't explode until he eventually comes out of his forge ball mode no matter where he is and it is is just kind of one of those funny things to actually see. Now this glitch also manages to work with a Spartan laser if you're holding a Spartan laser and you overcharge it right to the point where it's about to fire and then quickly go into the forge ball mode you can relocate and immediately launch it the second you come out of the forge ball. It's kind of terrifying. There's the good old turret glitch that you can do which is a glitch that was done even in Halo 3 but it works in Halo Reach as well where if you go up to one of these windows you can actually glitch your way into the the window pane and into this little area you're not supposed to actually be in. There's not too much more you can do. It's a shame you can't go and explore New Alexandria, but nonetheless, it's cool. This also works over by the elevator that typically plays Siege of Madrigal in Halo 2, but you can actually clip through this wall and there's this little secret room back here that you may or may not have known actually exists. Now there's nothing you can do in this room and there's a soft kill barrier, so you will die, but it's neat. There's this other area over on Swords Base you can do the same glitch on and you can clip through this wall and there's a little secret room back here. There's not much going on in it either but you can stand here. Okay then there's the spooky ghost of Forge World which is an old glitch that would occasionally happen when you would overload your maps in Halo Reach. Now it's a little bit harder to actually overload your Forge game in Halo Reach on MCC for whatever reason and this glitch ended up working out better on the original Xbox 360 version of Halo Reach. May it rest in peace. But essentially by overloading the map occasionally one player would appear invisible and you wouldn't see him because of the latency just kind of being stacked up on top of each other in Halo Reach and the other player could just drive around in a banshee and it would look like nobody was in it and it's just spooky. You could probably pull some pranks on your friends back in the day if you knew how to do this one correctly but you probably could also scare them if you're in forge mode and you just spawn a giant kill ball and you kill them with that. Nowadays when I'm playing MCC for whatever reason on Halo Reach I occasionally run into this really weird texture glitch where everything just starts flickering white and black. Uh, it's a little disruptive at first but it's just this weird oddity that happens. It probably has something to do with the pop in and out of textures at a distance. Something you can see in Forge World if you fly from far away to another side really quickly but for whatever reason in campaign it seems a little bit extra skewed. In the OG Halo Reach if you were shooting your 
your gun holding the trigger down and then press the start button, for whatever reason, your gun would just completely continue to shoot even if you let go of the trigger. Let's take a closer look at Forge World because there's already a lot of stuff that goes on here. Like for instance, in the old 360 version of this map, there was a really easy way you could overload the map by just spawning a bunch of items and vehicles together and slowly compressing them together to crush them. You can spin the grid around and just spin and spin. And if you have another player get near the grid, just sometimes chaos can happen. A lot of the times they die, but every once in a while you'll get a good launch off and your friend will just go flying. There's a special spot in the middle of the island where if you go inside of the tunnel, you can either put a teleporter through with the bottom ramp and get outside of the tunnel by using the teleporter, or you can even glitch through it with a turret or some other type of force. But yeah, there's this little secret bunker that you can create that's technically in an area you're not supposed to have access to by choosing some teleporters. And interestingly enough, you can see completely through the floor when you're down there and just see players walking up and down and they can't see you. Now you can't shoot through the ramp itself, but we did find in the process of testing this that if I was standing in the little glass window, I could shoot out out and hit Luke, but Luke couldn't shoot in and hit me, which definitely seems a little bit overpowered and maybe a little unfair, but it is still pretty funny. Of course, there's the iconic hot air balloon glitches where you can put a vehicle cannon inside of a tower and make sure they're both on normal physics and lift and drop them at the same time and the tower will just fly away. But you can also do this with a bunker and sometimes it works better and sometimes it works a little bit worse. You can actually put a grid underneath the water over in the little lagoon area and if you phase it through the sand just right you can have full games that work underwater and I mean the water physics are a little weird it's definitely foggy but there's been some good custom games that have existed with this underwater glitch. This next one doesn't sound as useful maybe now but back in the day it was pretty cool if you were in forge mode and you took your warthog and you kind of just lightly gently tapped on a kill ball you could pop the turret off of the back of the warthog and drive just a regular two seating truck around instead of a warthog with a machine gun turret on the back of it. Now when they added reach to MCC and they did the big forge update, they did just straight up add transport hogs even though you can't sit in the back, but they do have turretless warthogs just available now. However, I like my method a little bit better. This glitch is also usable in a custom game type mode when using a wraith where you can take the turret off and play a splatter type gameplay like cat and mouse. Way back in the earliest days of Halo Reach, there were some glitches that would occasionally occur and people would capture in theater mode, like this giant Spartan glitch. Also in Forge mode, if you put an armor lock down, you use it, activate armor lock, go into Forge mode while doing it, then spawn another armor lock and delete all of the armor locks. When you return to player mode, you'll be invincible and kind of have this infinite armor lock on, which is pretty cool. There's actually a zero gravity glitch you can do by doing this first glitch, where if you are with a jetpack and you melee another Another player that's not on your team but you don't kill them you can actually get an upwards float going and you'll kind of just glide around with zero gravity it's a little bit weird but interesting I have talked about this one before in a video but one time I was playing custom games and the game lagged or something and when we came back from the connecting screen all of a sudden I was in a first-person perspective in this weird haunted driving situation it was just really weird I could shoot my gun while driving too there's these cliffs up in forge world over where they're supposed to be an invisible soft kill barrier that you can just stand by and hang out. It's a good sniper spot. Also, when we were looking for glitches in Forge World, we noticed the shadows on these rocks just look a little weird. I don't know, if you look closer at them, it almost looks like the water is burned or there's this weird marking on the shadow that's independent from the water itself. If you take an extended bridge and grab a one-way shield, you can actually build a cool zip line on Forge or in any map really that gives you access to these pieces and you just jump in and you can just drag your head along and not die, you can make a cool way to get down from a high area without dying. I mean, stairs technically could work too, but I mean, it's a zip line. It's so much cooler. If you put down a hologram and then you trigger it at the same time as you go into forge mode, you actually will spawn out a Spartan that doesn't really look like you. It's just a different Spartan. 
it's not a direct replica. This also works on elites, though we noticed with the newer update, it doesn't randomize the armor anymore, it just randomizes the armor effect. One of my favorite glitches to do were the various launches that are available to do in Forge, specifically this one with the Revenant. If you have a Revenant and you grab a teleporter and you fly up as high as you can with the teleporter and then get another teleporter, change the in-game settings within the teleporter to allow for vehicles and then you boost into it with your Revenant, you can actually get yourself full-on slingshotted, not even just above the map, like way beyond into the stratosphere. I'm surprised I didn't hit the top of the halo ring and land my way back down and it's just fun. Typically you'll die from the soft kill barrier before you're able to land, but nonetheless it's still a really cool thing to try out and you can even mess around with it more by trying different directions or just trying to set it up in a different location to see what ends up happening, but definitely one we would recommend trying just because it's cool. When playing on forge mode if you were not the host and you were shooting and switched into your forge mode while still holding the trigger, a lot of the times you would hear the sound of a focus rifle shot and some of the time you would even see the beam of light coming from the focus rifle shot in your game. But this one only worked from your own perspective, all the other players wouldn't see it, but it's definitely one that's always made me wonder. The focus rifle was originally supposed to be a weapon that the monitors could use in forge mode or if that was going to be a feature that ended up getting cut at some point. Back in the day this was a really popular glitch or custom map, but apparently there was a modded map that put the entire Forge world playable area completely replaced with wall coliseums instead of the water itself, which while it was a map mod, the fact that you could share it over file share was not supposed to be a thing. Allowing you to trade this map that shouldn't exist was pretty awesome and it became an iconic map for a ton of different custom games. If you're standing with a detached turret and you walk backwards over an armor ability and then melee and pick up at the same time, you can actually walk around without any weapon at all. I actually remember finding this one with some friends all the way back in 2010 or 11 and I thought it was so cool and then I picked up evade like the armor equipment and started evading around and it just looked hilarious like this bunny rabbit type jumping thing. So I ended up going on to eBay and I bought this really cheap capture card. I think it was called like the Diamond VC 600 or something. I ended up spending like a hundred dollars on it. It was pretty overpriced and the quality was completely awful and it barely ever worked. It only worked like two times ever the whole time that I had it. But to this day on my old YouTube channel, I still have my glitch video where I did this bunny jump glitch. It had 800 views and two people talking about how the video was not good. Also, I had a Modern Warfare 2 gameplay capture card test that I uploaded on that channel and I got called a heartbeat sensor noob. Halo has been known for having weird latency issue glitches over the years and there was one glitch that always amazed me whenever I would see it pop up in a file share, but it would be whenever someone was being assassinated and somehow the game would lag and they'd be able to sidestep their own assassination and show stop themselves, which is the medal you get for stopping someone mid assassination. Also, this next one is one that I literally didn't know about until just recently and it completely blew my mind that I've been playing Halo Reach for all these years and I just didn't know. But when you're doing parkour in Halo Reach, if you have a plasma pistol and you overcharge your shot and crouch jump, you can actually get a upward momentum boost, something I had no clue about and I've been playing Halo for forever. Back in the days of Rocket Race or Rocket Hog Race, there was this amazing glitch where if the passenger player who isn't in the turret and just has the grenade launcher or whatever, or the rocket launcher, jumps out of the vehicle and grabs a turret and breaks it off of the mount, the game will teleport them into the passenger seat and they're still holding their turret, meaning you could be driving around with a warthog that had two machine gun turrets, which is amazing. Let's go ahead and move on to some other multiplayer maps outside of just Forge World. For instance, there's some cool glitches that show up on other maps too. There's Timberland, where you can build outside of the main map area by doing some glitches with the teleporters. If you essentially put a teleporter as far out as you can and then go through the teleporter and try to put another teleporter out even further, you can eventually glitch a teleporter all the way out there that you can then travel to and fly your way to a safe area where just out here there's no soft kill barrier, meaning you're free to build and this is essentially another blank canvas, while it's smaller than Forge World, that you can still build on and make some cool maps and a nice little change of scenery. Now it seems like in the most recent update they may have done a patch that makes it harder to travel out there. You used to be able just to kind of throw a teleporter and it would just work. Now you have to kind of do the glitch in the way I described it, specifically by using one other teleporter ahead of time and kind of break through the wall, but it is still possible at the very least. 
just on Powerhouse, there's this good old glitch where if you have your friend just stand up on this platform and tell them to crouch and walk around on it, it'll pressure launch them at a high speed right into the wall and they will die. It's just a fun thing to have your friends do. We've talked about this one before, but on any map really, but in this specific map we did Spire, if you put a bunch of the one-way shields around and just shoot a plasma repeater into it, the bullets will just shoot all over the place and it looks hilarious and it becomes this big glowing mess after a while. It's chaotic, but it's fun. Over on Breakpoint, if you just spawn a bunch of rocket launchers and just shoot at the phantom that's there for a while, eventually the phantom will just explode, but the outline of the phantom is still there. Like for whatever reason, the dead phantom doesn't despawn properly and it just stays there, just chilling there, almost like a phantom. That was a really bad joke, I'm sorry. This next one works on campaign or on the multiplayer map Boneyard, but if you go stand in this corner and kind of crouch and maybe jump a little bit, it's on the far side of the map. There's a pressure launch point that'll just kind of push you all the way back. It's a 50-50 chance you'll die depending on how much speed you get, but it's another one you can tell your friends to kind of go check out. Tell them there's a secret gun in there if they can crouch and jump into the little thing and just see what happens. On the multiplayer map Tempest or really any place that has these types of structures, you can have some fun with a war hog and glitch through various walls and doors whether you're on foot trying to jump into a turret where you phase through a wall or you're in the back of a warthog trying to phase through a wall sometimes it works that way too looking over to firefight mode there's some interesting glitches that we've covered in the past as well on sword base there's a way that you can force yourself into this little room where all these shields are and no enemies can actually get to you all you have to do is get creative a bit with some crates and kind of force their way through while also pushing yourself at the same time Forklifts may be helpful. Over on Corvette, you can use the giant spirit that's there to clip your way through the big shield and stand outside for a bit. Much like we talked about earlier on in the video, like on Long Night of Solace, if you're playing on waterfront, you can duck under the water and not get shot. For whatever reason, they just cannot see you. I also remember watching this really old video from way back in the day where someone was playing on Beachhead and these hunters just got lost. Like the AI just did not know what to do whatsoever. And it was pretty hilarious to say the least. I don't know. I just remember people putting this video to other songs and other memes along the way. And I just think it's funny whenever a glitch like this ends up happening. Also for this last glitch, there's this invalid weapon glitch where essentially you can hand off your weapons to various covenant enemies in firefight versus mode. It's a little confusing to do, but YouTuber General Luigi did a video showing off the glitch and he has kind of the best accent when explaining Halo things. Here's a little clip of it. A rarely used aspect of Firefight was the ability to play on the Covenant's team as an elite and assist them in destroying enemy Spartans. This mode was called Firefight Versus. So if you guys have ever wanted to see grunts holding sniper rifles and shooting at you, this is a great opportunity to learn a new glitch and watch his video. Okay, now we'll go ahead and shift gears and take a closer look at Halo Combat Evolved, which of course started the franchise off and originally released in 2000. 2001 on Xbox. It then was re-released in 2003 on PC and the Mac, and then the campaign was remastered for Halo Combat Evolved Anniversary in 2011. Then finally, it would be ported to the Master Chief Collection in 2014, with the 2003 multiplayer being added in from the 2003 PC build with some improvements. We'll be covering quite a bit of everything, but the most important thing to remember is that the MCC version with the anniversary graphics was mostly based off of the 2003 PC release. So it's been interesting to see how there have been some retroactive things that have only shown up in this version of the game. On the Maw, if you can break out of the map by jumping over here and you look at the graphics on the older resolution, it just looks really odd, just the way the whole skybox is. Similarly on Damnation in Halo Combat Evolved, if you look out the windows and just glance off into the distance, you can see some water for a bit, but then you can just see this giant tile of textures or something that's just there. It doesn't look very natural, but it is one of those little nuanced things that I do like to point out to people who might not have recognize that in Combat Evolved all those years ago. We also can't forget the fact that in Halo Combat Evolved, we had the legendary level Battle Creek introduced for multiplayer. And despite the water looking like it was some plasma energy shield, it does look a little bit more dated than other textures in Halo games. For instance, when Beaver Creek rolled around for Halo 2, they definitely did revise the water effect on that level. Okay, and then this next, in Halo Combat Evolved, on any Combat Evolved level that has a banshee and some trees, if you actually fly into the tree and then slightly look up when shooting, the Banshee's projectiles will actually most of the time fly straight up into the sky, meaning 
technically you can shoot targets straight above you without needing to even look at them. If we look over to Assault on the Control Room, when you get to the lift and you throw a plasma grenade in the middle of the lift and then activate it to go down, the plasma grenade will actually float in the air until it explodes. If you end up dying to a flood infection form and then throw a grenade right as you die, the grenade throwing animation will actually finish before you die, but you can see it from a third person view with the death camera and just see your character standing there awkwardly. On Silent Cartographer or on Death Island if you prefer, you know, multiplayer levels, if you drive your Warthog out into the water and submerge the turret, the ammo on the belt that feeds the chain gun is actually invisible and it just looks like the gun is empty. Also on Silent Cartographer, if you kill Sergeant Johnson, he will have like this weird creepy mouth on original graphics or this like really long neck thing on anniversary graphics. Why is this a thing? On the map Danger Canyon, if you turn off friendly fire and your teammate rams you with a warthog, you can get stuck inside the wall or the ground. Now, there isn't much to it and it seems like they kind of half fixed it in MCC, but allegedly all the way back in the day, people used to do this glitch to get through the wall between the two bases to get into the other team's base, and this was referred to as leaking. There's a really cool trick that you can utilize if you're doing lasso that we ended up having to use called backpack reloading, or there's like two versions of it technically, and we're not probably the best at defining which is which. You can watch our lasso video if you want more information specifically on it, but the basics of it, whether you do the backpack version of it, or like I think what we actually technically do is like this infinite ammo version of it, but essentially by starting a reload animation and quickly swapping out weapons on the ground, you are technically able to finish reloading a weapon all the way to a full magazine that otherwise would be completely empty or close to empty. This is extra helpful on levels like the library with the shotgun because the shotgun has quite a bit of shells in it before you have to completely load it up again, meaning you can actually benefit from having it fully loaded. Or also the rocket launcher because hey, if you can use a rocket launcher to survive a little bit longer and you're doing lasso, it's definitely a benefit here. It's still a little tricky to do, but if you practice it a little bit, it definitely does pay off. Okay, this next one's an oldie but a classic on the 343 Guilty Spark level from Halo Combat Evolved. If you jump on the pelican quick enough at the very beginning of the level when you exit the pelican and you're like in the lush forest or whatever, you can actually ride the pelican up long enough if you're fast enough to get on top of the pelican and then make this big leap over to this cliff. If you can stick the landing, you can then walk around in the wilderness for a while and then you find everybody's favorite marine that's used as a placeholder out here just chilling out of bounds he likes trees that's that's the takeaway. Assault on the control room, you can actually go back down to that pit in the very beginning section of the level just by holding down the enter vehicle button the second you get dropped off at the beginning of the level. This is easier in co-op mode to do, but then you get this really awkward ride back down in this pelican. A lot of times you can end up falling to your death, but sometimes you get flung the right way and you can land and survive and explore this mysterious area. There's some dead grunts down here too. We accidentally got out of bounds on truth and reconciliation thinking we found a great shortcut when we we're doing lasso and um, it messes with the whole loading zones of this level though if you do want to try to just explore this upper part of the cliff it is kind of cool you can shoot down at stuff but you do eventually have to go back into the map and hit the load zones in the right order there's also a couple of really interesting out of bounds glitches that you can do in various halo combat evolve levels most popularly on pillar of autumn you can glitch up into like the rafters for speed running you can even glitch out of bounds and get to the outer space area which is always kind of a wild area to be in hey here's a question do you suck at parkour well, on Silent Cartographer, you have to do a pretty intense jump if you want to get one of the hidden skulls out here, and it's a pain. But we found a way to get up there by glitching a vehicle into this tunnel and then trying to lunge ourselves through the ceiling just to get our heads stuck and grab the skull. It actually works. It's a pain, but it's better if you aren't good at jumping. On Assault on the Control Room, there's also another glitch that a lot of people use in Legendary or Lasso playthroughs. If you can survive falling off this cliff here at the first bridge section, none of the enemies will load. For the entirety of the rest of the level, which makes beating this level a really, really easy process. Though the hard part, of course, here is surviving this fall. We came up with a pretty good co-op strategy that involves one person dying, which is pretty easy to do. But if you're doing something like Deathless or Solo, you definitely can't go for this strategy. So you have to either be really good at lining up your jumps or do a Banshee drop, which is like you time walking backwards and then the Elite will randomly just leap.
leap out of a banshee dropping it off for you which is helpful and then you can just fly the banshee to the end of the level and boom you're done you didn't have to do that much work just figure out one little trick it's still a hard trick to pull off have you ever explored the outside area of the level keys like up on top of the canyon area it looks like this if you ever were wondering what it looked like you can do it by doing some grenade jumps with skull modifiers but yeah you can get out of bounds it uh, it looks like a weird carved out structure that was just a block at one point but hey it looks neat there's also some weird janky things that can happen with the player model or just other things from combat evolved specifically like for instance on the first level pillar of autumn you can look inside the cryo tubes and see like a headless master chief model in there for some reason i don't think this was always here i think this is like a newer mcc thing that definitely hasn't been fixed yet also there's a ton of really funny glitches that can happen if you manipulate stuff in the background during a in-game rendered cutscene, like master chief getting spotted by a banshee which we've always thought was funny i don't know there's sevens from time to time where master chief just dies in a cutscene, and i just can't help but to think it's hilarious every time it does happen okay back in halo custom edition for the pc there were some glitches that didn't ever make their way into later versions of the game like we can't do these in mcc but some of the vehicle launches and glitches associated with the warthog were just incredible and there were so many great clips in the mid 2000s that people would upload of them doing some just crazy flips and spins and jumps with the warthog that i wish we could recreate and do those glitches nowadays in the newer version of halo unfortunately we can't and we're still stuck with this warthog that splatters you if it barely touches you with a tire on the level keys you can actually do a really cool trick by utilizing a flood that like will die and come back to life by baiting him into this corner killing him here and then standing in a certain way so that when he respawns you clip through the wall you can make it to a later section of the level significantly faster the enemies glitch out and it's a good trick for using in speed running or lasso runs here because honestly who wants to play in the outdoor section of this level there's actually quite a few sections across halo combat evolves campaign where you can utilize out of bound glitches to move past rooms that you normally would have to go in and if you play on combat evolved anniversary you can actually see the textures loaded in permanently unlike in old halo which makes anniversary graphics utilized here in a lot of speed runs because you can actually see where you're going and you can try to hit some loads ahead of time rather than playing through normally which could be once again great for speed runs on the flip side though combat evolved anniversary isn't usually prioritized in speed runs as the main graphics used other than this specific occasion cea ends up getting skipped in a lot of competitive scenes with people taking favor to the original graphics because in things like speed runs or lasso runs some of the textures have pretty severe visual glitches that don't line up correctly to the geometry of the map or layout itself sometimes there's even entire sections of the map walled off an anniversary that you can actually go in or just random objects not being lined up correctly when you switch between the two graphics so on silent cartographer we had this instance where one of us died during the cutscene and it just led to some really weird things going on also on the level assault on the control room if you're flying your banshee in fast enough you can accidentally splatter master chief in the cutscene it would lead to a really interesting alternate universe in halo but i'm pretty sure it's not supposed to happen okay so this next one is actually kind of interesting but we found this really old video from 2007 on the level silent cartographer where in the cutscene when master chief walks onto the bridge if there is a warthog parked right at the edge of where chief is trying to stand there is a chance he'll just teleport forward and fall into the void okay, going on to the maw for halo combat evolved if you actually get into the elevator too early or too quickly you can put yourself below the elevator and make it leave without you which kind of just gets you stuck in this limbo state where you're supposed to be making this mad epic drive out of the maw and instead you're just stuck down here trying to live your best life i guess i i, I don't know this one's really awkward to get stuck in there were always the group of players who would just try to floor the warthog right into the hallways of the indoor sections but interestingly enough forcing the warthog through these hallways does have its benefits for instance if you're trying to get the skull that's hidden on this level you can use the warthog sometimes to clip through the ceiling and access the skull instead of having to do a complicated grenade jump and speedrunners actually use the warthog forcing it down the hallways and around the corner to lunge themselves through the door before it closes to save time having to go around the map and open up the door manually assault on the control room is definitely a fan favorite when it comes to taking vehicles we are not supposed to because obviously these little rocks trying to stop you from driving your ghost past it just aren't really good enough because i've taken my ghost past it pretty much every time and if you're feeling really creative you can just drive your ghost up through the hallways you know those really narrow tight corridors because why not and there's this giant door that you can glitch your ghost through as well or at least 
least force it through the little opening and there, boom, you have a ghost for the next section of the level. On two betrayals, we really wanted to see how far we could get the Banshee or if we could even get the Banshee into any place we weren't supposed to. So we decided to see if maybe we could just force it down a hallway. Surprisingly enough, we actually got it all the way wedged into the door frame and we were in the hallway for a little while, just kind of crashing and breaking all the windows in the process. We felt pretty achieved in that, but we wanted to see how far we could actually take it. So we did eventually manage to push the Banshee all the way inside the main room, just kind of shooting at the enemies that were in there, which was pretty neat. Now Luke and I were pretty determined. We would have liked to see if we could have gotten it even further down the hallway or maybe even outside of the canyon. And maybe there is some way we don't know about, but we pushed it around in there the best we could, but this little hallway just seemed too small. So then our next approach was to come back with two Banshees this time. So of course we could have one Banshee to try to push the other Banshee through, which unfortunately did not work, but it was still pretty fun to drag the Banshee through there, hearing all that glass just shatter when we were going through the hallway. One of my favorite textures or things that exists in Combat Evolved is on Captain Key's patch. It just says, hello, my name Keys. I just, I've talked about this before. I don't know why I have this appreciation for the incorrect grammar and how it's all crammed together as one word to fit it. I don't know if it was intentional. I don't know if it was an inside joke, but nonetheless, it seriously is one of the best things in Combat Evolved, hands down. Also, if you've been following the Master Chief Collection's development recently, you would know that they are currently flighting and also working on releasing some updated visuals to the Halo games to make the textures and visual appearances look a lot more like what they originally did back in Combat Evolved. And some of you who watch our live streams or our other videos might remember our very fantastic Christmas special where we had our friend Peter put together a fantastic Christmas mod and we saved Christmas. He also helped us find footage for this video, putting together a lot of the comparisons of how Halo Combat Evolved originally looked versus what we actually see in the Master Chief Collection before this big update that they're flighting. Some interesting things to notice are sometimes some of the textures are different and they're grittier and shinier in alternate versions. It was kind of weird because sometimes Master Chief looked shiny in one version and then grittier later on in that same version, but then MCC was the reverse at times. I suspect Master Chief is supposed to be maybe cleaner in the original Combat Evolved at the beginning and gets grittier and dirtier over time, but then MCC maybe didn't translate that, or maybe it's all in my head and I'm just imagining different things. I definitely realized in the Keys cutscene, Jacob Keys' bathwater looks completely different between the two different versions of the game. And also, while this one probably shouldn't fully count in this video, when we were looking into the whole body stretches thing from our other video we did recently, we found this image of someone who had a very similar glitch happen in Halo Combat Evolved. And it is a visual glitch. It does seem like maybe it would be the source of inspiration for a creepypasta, but we wanted to still mention it and include it too. We've also had weird experiences on our own occurrences when we've played through the Halo games. Like one time in Combat Evolve, Luke died during a cutscene and then his screen was flashing red and then after the cutscene ended Luke was inside of my character's helmet or he was seeing the same perspective that I was seeing though I was still controlling the character and it just did it. All right now we're gonna go ahead and look at Halo 2 which released in 2004 for the original Xbox. It did release again in 2007 for Windows Vista and this Windows Vista version of Halo 2 would be the basis for the remaster in Halo 2 Anniversary and and the MCC launch with Halo 2 that allowed you to toggle between graphics. Much like with Combat Evolved, there were some differences between the PC version and the original version that then were grandfathered in to the MCC version and then later would be retroactively changed and altered. So it's interesting to see a wide variety of what has existed as glitches and later would be changed or altered later on. Let's go ahead and take a closer look at Halo 2 now. Halo 2 Elites, if they are dual wielding a weapon, when they turn aggro, they will instantly pull out their sword because their sword draw animation gets canceled by the action of them dropping a weapon. Every single elite heretic on Arbiter has its melee completely broken where it won't do any damage to you. If you stand up on this ledge and an elite is following you, it will lose track of you and just leave you alone. If you lean your head too far close to a wall while walking into it, intentionally or not, you are head glitching, making it where enemies will have a much more difficult time seeing you because your head is now clipped through a wall. Sometimes when playing through Halo 2, certain dialogue just won't play. On Halo 2 Anniversary Sacred Icon, this phantom flies in backwards in the cutscene. Okay, this one would probably get a pass, but I just wanted to acknowledge that just they never fixed that. 
that's just a thing that happens here. On Halo 2 Regret, if you kill the elites that spawn in here too quickly, more will spawn in. There's only supposed to be two elites. However, because of this, if you're just playing through the game too quickly, boom, all of a sudden you have four. Elites that carry a carbine a lot of the times can have offset melee hitboxes. And if you're playing an original Halo 2, technically there is the possibility that when you're just jumping, you could accidentally hit a super bounce. Even if it is just the slightest, tiniest bit of a upward bounce because of the way that Halo 2 works, that would technically disqualify your entire run there too. This one would be a great one to just have your entire run end after you've played through all of Halo 2, but occasionally when you're playing in Halo 2, the final cutscene will glitch out, and if there are elites or brutes standing by where the cutscene section takes place, they will glitch into the final cutscene also, and just kind of be there awkwardly. They're not intended to be there. Also, while speaking of things that could go wrong on the last level of the game earlier on, sometimes the pathing on the Great Journey with the elites and the banshees can be a little bit off, and when they're supposed to fly in to drop you a banshee off, they just drop it off the side of the map, and you have to drop down to try to get the banshee. Metropolis was this level that vehicle abuse could just be used all over the place, the big one being forcing the banshee into the second half of the level. Now typically the game doesn't like you being in a banshee if you're inside the tunnel section. It'll just fling you outside at such a crazy speed. Though, if you're able to lure a banshee all the way through the tunnels right to where the loading point is at the exit of the tunnel, you can actually hijack it and not be just completely launched. And then from there, you can fly the banshee around Metropolis. People use this all the time to go get the secret scarab gun that was just kind of placed out of bounds here, but also from there, you can explore this area. There's also this huge section down here by the water you can go and look at. There's even another way over there if you trick the pelican into jumping back into it, kind of like what you could do on Assault in the Control Room in Halo Combat Evolved. You can go for a little ride and it just kind of like takes you out there. This level has always been a cool level just to mess around on. On the level outskirts, there is the pelican that flies in here and if you hit it at just the right angle, you can be bounced way to Hotel Zanzibar significantly faster and that could save you a ton of time if you're speed running. But one thing we've done before, because why not, was drive a warthog up the stairs of the indoor section of the level and drove it onto the scarab. We just wanted to see if we could do it, and sure enough, we were able to do it. Delta Halo is another one of those levels that's just interesting because there's so many points where you can just jump on a ghost and glide your way out of the level, way beyond where you're originally intended to go, and do a bunch of shortcuts along the way. But seriously, the total scope of where you can go and what parts you can skip on Delta Halo is pretty cool. Then if we look to the end of Halo 2 on the Just Okay journey. This is one that I always did because I just like to, but you can fly the Banshee through the main door and just kind of ram it through all of the debris and take it in for the final boss fight, which is cool in itself. But there's also a way you can glitch the Spectre in through the main area and use that on the boss fight, leading you to be able to do the Sergeant Johnson duplication glitch, which is really helpful on higher difficulties. You just gotta drive your Spectre up this cliff wall, just kind of pop over the top of the building, park it right here and time it just right and bam you got the specter in. On the level regret if you turn on the Sputnik skull and play through the level mostly normal and you pick up the fuel rod gun before the elevator then bring it with you all the way to the end boss fight you can actually just shoot it at the prophet until he flips and it seems like it flips in a similar mechanic to a vehicle in Halo 2. The interesting thing is the prophet will just like fall out and just like lay there for a while or sit there awkwardly and then he will eventually teleport and the whole thing will reset but you can keep doing it and it's kind of funny. On the map Backwash in the original Halo 2 you can make the monitor that's flying around the map freeze in mid-air if you're in a solo lobby and jump into the gargoyle that we only recently learned about. The monitor will end up just freezing there in your view. Interestingly enough if you jump out of the little gargoyle spot he just starts flying around normally again. On the great journey if you manage to hijack the banshee at the end and the brute survives he'll actually be friendly and not attack you. The cross here will be red, but he'll just follow you wherever you go. You can take a little splash in the water with him. It's a cool little bond. If you load up on Delta Halo and you go over the mountain without hitting the Jackal sniper load, the hologram of the Prophet by the bridge will only have his chair, not the Prophet himself. And if you end the mission without hitting that load, the throne will also not have the Prophet in it. Now, as we were doing this, we decided to backtrack real quick, and we found that these enemies over here in the bridge section haven't despawned while the 
the level around them has. So there's like this floating plasma turret with a grunt on it. You can kill the grunt and then hop onto the floating plasma turret and shoot the enemies that spawned. Also at the same time, we saw this phantom spawn inside of the mountain and it kind of just flopped around before it despawned. On quarantine zone, there is one sentinel that shoots needles and drops a needler when you kill it. This technically isn't a glitch, but it is an oversight from Bungie when developing the game. They left the tag in for this variant of a sentinel that did later on get cut. Also, all of the elites that are in the level the Arbiter or anytime you would see heretic elites have their shield broken animations messed up or something where they're supposed to punch you to death or do something and they just can't. They just kind of slap you around. Okay, this next one's only in the original Halo 2, but on Metropolis, sometimes when you would kill a jackal on top of the scarab in a specific spot, the dead body would turn blue and it almost looked like it had elite armor. This most likely was a lighting glitch caused by the inside of the scarab being lit up all blue. If you load up on Uprising and kill all of the brutes at the beginning, eventually elite allies will drop in with drop pods and if you stand at the exact spot where they drop, you can actually get inside and if you killed the allied elite quick enough, the pod actually never opens and you're stuck inside the pod until you move. This one we've also talked about a bunch so we won't go into too much detail but you might have seen it in Gervalen's Halo 2 Lasso Deathless run but there are some tricks known as ghosting where if you walk into a specific object long enough and maybe like melee or do something specific you can offset your player hitbox or view box and that can allow you to clip through doors skipping large portions of the level. Gervalen was really good at doing this like you can see on the screen right now. On outskirts in the sniper alley, there is a, this specific sniper jackal that if you shoot it in the chest, it'll drop its beam rifle and then pull out a plasma pistol and it'll just sit there being frozen in place. If you do get close to it, it will shoot at you, but not move. Right at the beginning of the Arbiter, if you keep watching the three phantoms that fly away behind you, they will eventually despawn for a second, respawn, but then they start free falling and then eventually disappear again. Though if you switch to anniversary graphics, after they disappear for the second time in the original graphics, you can just see them spinning around and then flipping. If you load up on any Halo 2 map with a Warthog and a Plasma Pistol and sit in the passenger seat and then overcharge the Plasma Pistol, when you get out, your Spartan will be shaking the pistol without any indication it's overcharged. Like he's just scared or something, he's, he's just going. At the beginning of the Oracle, if you push Half Jaw onto the elevator with you and if you keep him there until the elevator starts, Half Jaw will just teleport away. Kind like the Prophet of Regret does at the earlier example of the boss fight, but this time it's half jaw and he's just gone. On Zanzibar, if you throw a grenade at the top left corner of the non-lowered bridge by the big fan thing, the grenade will actually start sliding off in slow motion and not explode until it slides all the way off. You can just slowly watch it fall for a good while. Over on the map Ascension, if you load up with overshields and stand at the ledge where the Banshee spawns and then have a second player boost into you with the Banshee as you jump, it will launch you off the map through some clouds onto an invisible platform at the bottom of the map. And if you survive, you're just stuck there on this little platform outside the map there and there's like nowhere to move or anything. Back when MCC launched in the last cutscene of Halo 2 where you see Cortana, if you switch between anniversary and old graphics, Cortana will have half of her face missing. If you are playing a playlist like Master Chief Saga, the game might actually soft lock on the Cortana face and you won't be able to progress on to Halo 3. Okay, then there's this huge, huge, huge glitch that we've talked about before on this channel, so we won't go too much into detail, but arbitrary unit possession. It was one of the biggest discoveries in Halo 2 history, but essentially by playing in co-op and utilizing different inputs, like shooting a gun a ton of times, it's possible to manipulate the game's code to allow a player to respawn or spawn in as some sort of object available on any given campaign level. This has led to some hilarious interactions, like like playing Halo 2 as a grunt or playing Halo 2 as a phantom. We did a whole video where we explained how this works and then also had help playing through Halo 2 as some weird objects. It's definitely worth checking out if you guys haven't seen it already and maybe at the end of this video because there's some really interesting glitches that we're still going to get into here. Okay then over in Halo 2 this one's an easy one but there's a really simple scarab glitch where if you drop onto the scarab you stand kind of right here and drop into this little nook. You can actually see right into the scarab and from here you can actually shoot at enemies 
and they have a harder time shooting at you back, making it a very good method if you're playing on a really high difficulty. I mean, I guess for this part of the video, we're going like bare basic glitches when we're talking about here. But hey, these are the classic ones. Like for instance, the BXR glitch. It was a really, really simple glitch back in the day that was just a button combination of BX and then R, which allowed you when reloading your battle rifle to end your reload animation quicker, allowing you to shoot faster, which became a combo that was used pretty much by a lot of very good players in between very intense battles. You might already know this, but Delta Halo and Regret very obviously share a lot of the same overworld for the level, though the loading sequences and individual sections are loaded in based on what section of the level you're in. But if you're on Delta Halo, you can glitch out of the map and travel all the way over to the area where Regret takes place on and see very primitive details when it comes to what loads in actually. And similarly on Regret, you can back travel out of the level and see where you just were in Delta Halo, except once again, with those really primitive, just basic structures being outlined since those versions of the levels didn't need the assets from the previous level. Oh baby, does anyone remember sword flying? This one's always been a iconic piece when it comes to Halo 2, where you can use an energy sword, kind of time zooming in and swinging just correctly, and essentially get a lunge from a much larger distance than what's intended for the energy sword. Now this has evolved over the years, and people have been able to pull off some pretty incredible skips using the energy sword, and this sword lunge technique, but even as a casual player, you may have had a lot of fun just doing like little sword lunges here and there just because it's such a fun system that you can kind of manipulate through Halo 2 mechanics. Similarly, if you were a Halo 2 player back in the day, you might remember those good old super bounce lobbies that used to exist, or maybe you just super bounced on your own. But nonetheless, in old school Halo 2, not the Master Chief Collection, because of something with the tick rate, this doesn't work in the newer versions, but back in the day, if you kind of timed a crouch and a jump at the same time and hit certain geometry a specific way, you could essentially have the game think that you're moving at a much higher velocity than you are, which would then result in you essentially getting a super bounce. Now, there were various reasons you might want to try this, besides the fact that it's just fun to bounce around if you got good at these. You could maybe hit a cool clip and put it in your YouTube montage when YouTube finally did come out, like a year after this game came out. Or maybe you use super bouncing to access an area you couldn't reach before and use that as a key to maybe glitch out of a map. It was pretty cool. Now, this one's a little similar to sword flying and kind of BXR at the same time, but it's different. Instead of doing a reload cancel, you're doing a melee cancel, lunge cancel. But by essentially melee canceling the flood, you can kind of cling on and do this sword fly type mechanic. It's like a lunge mechanic that locks you into an animation with the flood. Now, if you do this on the level high charity, you can actually fly on the flood. And from there, you can kind of maneuver and aim your way or your direction with the flood all the way in this outer section of the level, flying your way to the end of the level and bypassing the entire level altogether. Also, while we're on the topic of just high charity in this skip, if you are playing on anniversary graphics, you can actually go in Acrophobia and fly over to this same area. If you angle yourself just right, you can see in the distance where the original Halo 2 Warthog run would have been, since obviously it didn't officially exist and it was never put into the final game. There weren't textures for it, but they were there at one point, I think, and then in Halo 2 Anniversary, they never textured that section, obviously, because it wasn't a part of the game, and that's why we can sometimes see it kind of reflecting in the distance. It's a little nod to something that was built, and probably nobody knew it was just right over there in High Charity until later on. In the Halo 2 level, Grave Mind, if you're playing on a higher difficulty, anything that can help you survive the firefight at the beginning is definitely helpful, and by standing in specific places, you can actually block enemies from triggering a specific loading sequence, and by doing so, the game will just scroll right past the loading sequence, causing less enemies to spawn in, making the overall fight significantly shorter. At the end of the level Gravemind, there's this white elite here, and every time you play on this level, for whatever reason, he will have randomized armor. We don't know why. On the level Regret, there's this weird bleed-through effect with some of the elites, especially noticeable on the gondolas if you have a sniper rifle, where you can actually see a lot of the enemies through the walls of the gondola, because they have these shiny reflective lights that somehow just bleed through the surfaces. Halo 2 campaign back in the day and your disc had maybe just a little bit of regular wear and tear on the level outskirts or even Metropolis and some of the other levels too, sometimes the sky or skybox would completely fall apart or have this weird bleed through effect of structures that once were there. Like maybe at one specific camera angle, you were looking up at a building and then you walked away and you look up at the sky and you might 
might see some outline of what the building once looked like, kind of. It's really hard to explain, but hopefully we got enough visual representation to showcase this. But I remember back in the day when I played through Halo 2, I spent a good amount of time wondering if I just left my Xbox on for too long and burned an image into my screen. Definitely wasn't the case, it was just Halo 2 and my disc being a little bit scuffed. There's a lot of visual glitches or just weird occurrences that can also happen that are completely out of your control, whether you mean for something to happen or not. I was watching streamer Figway play through Halo 2 Legendary Deathless, and he just had this jackal one time, just doing this thing. Yeah, I don't know. Also, when an elite does his swing with the sword, technically the sword is supposed to fully have a rotation hitbox with it. However, there's a pretty big hole in the hitbox itself, which is why so many players can just quickly sidestep an elite swing, even though the swing is supposed to be all-encompassing just to wreck you if you get hit by it. In Halo 2 Anniversary, every once in a while you may have heard this one happening if you've watched Lasso playthroughs, but sometimes backsmacking doesn't work. This also happens in regular Halo 2, but it happens way more often in Halo 2 Anniversary. Also, more often in Halo 2 Anniversary than regular Halo 2, just boxes flinging around will crush you and kill you. This doesn't happen as much in Halo 2, which means that it's more as a result of some sort of glitch in the physics engine and damage acceleration or something that causes the death, but it is worth noting there is a discrepancy, meaning that it's likely a cause of some sort of error along the way in porting. One time, Dravalin was playing Halo 2 Anniversary and he had Tartarus just break randomly. Like he had no idea what was going on, but it was kind of hilarious. Oh my God, get a life, dude. Hey. Why is he jumping off the edge? No way, this is not real. <laughs> This could be another potential place where your game would just technically be invalidated because even though Dravalin didn't intentionally cause this glitch to happen, it is a glitch that gave him a massive benefit. There's also random occurrences where even enemies may accidentally do a super bounce, similarly to how a player could accidentally super bounce too. Uh-oh. That Sniper Jackal just did a super bounce. You saw it here first! On the Halo 2 level Oracle, there is a chance that if you stick the heretic leader during the boss fight, he might just randomly drop his weapon. Just a random chance of that happening, but it has happened before, which once again falls into this rule of a run being invalidated because of an unintentional glitch happening. Also, in some instances, if you stand on a phantom, like an enemy phantom, it'll just shoot through itself and hit you, which is kind of OP. This one actually happens more often than maybe what you would think of for a glitch like this, but for some reason on Sacred Icon in the final firefight section, sometimes the flood will just overwhelm Halfjaw and he'll just get launched into orbit. It's kind of hilarious, but it is something that happens and I don't think it was intended to be something that happens. Also, over the years, there's been multiple, multiple occurrences of people reporting on random elites throughout the campaign, getting kind of weird pathing on them, which causes them to get confused and sometimes will result in interesting movement things happening, which like obviously something like this is some sort of glitch going on here. Level Regret, we've talked about this level a tiny bit in the past, but there is the elevator glitch that is very popular that you can do by pushing over crates from the underwater section of the level and blocking the elevator so that when a loading sequence happens, you're on top of the elevator and you essentially have free reign to explore the underwater section of the level. This one was one we've done in the past and we always have fun just looking around and on new graphics, it's very interesting just because of the attention to detail that was put into this area, but the one we found more recently was really fun to do throughout the level regret. Essentially, if you pop on the Feather Skull and maybe throw Sputnik and Boom Skull on as well while you're at it, you can jump out of the opening area of the level and make your way back to where the level Delta Halo kind of takes place and jump up onto the mountain. From there, we traveled down and made our way to the lowest section where the mountain meets the water, and at that point, you can actually just go directly underwater and have free reign to the entire level of regret, but underwater instead. I can't believe it took me until just a couple of days ago to actually discover this glitch. I guess I just never thought about trying it out, but it was really cool to see. I'm sure a lot of people have found this long before us, but it was exciting and new to us, okay? Interestingly enough, we actually noticed that you can see the elevator opening where the first elevator comes out of typically, and if you grenade jump, you can actually launch yourself into the elevator shaft. However, there's not much you can actually
actually do once you're in there and you likely fall to your death so it's not one you want to probably spend too much time on but it's cool nonetheless that it is there if you journey all the way back to where the final gondola ride is you can actually see on new graphics the cave entrance and if you make your way on top of the mountain and you're on new graphics you can actually see the whole area leading up to the gondola section but on old graphics it's just completely caved over with a cliff and this was really bizarre obviously there's something weird going on with the loadings and how this level processes the loadings and chooses when to have this mountain wall covering up this area and when not to but it was kind of funny that we were stuck just above this area of the level on new graphics but old graphics definitely said otherwise then just out of curiosity we made our way over to the final area where you typically face off against regret and since we had the feather skull on with all those other skulls we actually found that we could in fact grenade jump from the ground and make our way up one of the legs of the building and fortunately enough it's just not too steep where you can walk up far enough along then do a grenade jump to a lower level and since i was doing this with luke we were able to just spawn on each other and make sure we had multiple chances of trying these jumps without dying and it was funny because when we made our way around to the front of the building it's all just walled off because it hasn't actually hit the loading sequence that gives you access to the inside of the building yet we were somewhat hopeful that maybe we had discovered a shortcut on this level that no one else had known about that you can only do with the feather skull we were wrong but out of curiosity we did climb up to the top of the building and in new graphics you can look inside of the building and see the water and the rest of the stuff there we thought it'd be funny if we just saw regret chilling in there it didn't happen that way but nonetheless it was fun to make our way up here and then finally we decided to make our way back around the cliff going to the beginning of the delta halo level which was really interesting because delta halo is isn't even technically a part of this level though when they were building both of these levels they obviously used one canvas and then changed the loading sequences on both of them but if you go all the way back to where you start off in Delta Halo where the ODST drop typically comes in you can actually go into the lake back there and just do whatever you want it's interesting seeing the whole area without foliage or any of the other stuff that typically loads in but you can more or less tell where everything in Delta Halo is but this time you get to go underwater and that's kind of neat as well we also decided to load Delta Halo up and do the same same thing but in reverse where instead we went forward to where regret typically would take place and sure enough we were able to go underwater again and explore a lot of different areas under the water turns out the elevator shaft is still there even on the level delta halo but definitely one of the most interesting things is this random box that's just floating above the water we don't really know what purpose it serves or why it's there we tried to get on top of it it was too difficult but if you know why that box is there please let us know it's on both old and new graphics all right so we're going in chronological order so why while you would think Halo 3 is the next one in line, technically Halo 3 ODST takes place during the events and a little bit after the events of Halo 2. So ODST ends up being next here, which released in 2009 for the Xbox 360 and was a standalone campaign with firefight mode, but then that actually came with a second disc that gave you access to multiplayer with all of Halo 3's multiplayer maps. Halo 3 ODST is a fan favorite. It would later be added into the Master Chief Collection in in 2015, a couple of months after MCC initially released, and it was sold for like $5 as DLC, but because MCC had such a shoddy launch, anybody who played MCC in the earliest days ended up getting Halo 3 ODST as a free gift which like I pointed out earlier in this video was interesting because at that time it meant all of the first person shooter Halo games were in one single game except Reach. Reach was just left out for the longest time. Nonetheless let's go ahead and take a closer look at Halo 3 ODST. So to start things off we decided to look at a glitch that I didn't fully quite understand just yet and we thought that streaming it would be a perfect opportunity since we were going to go get footage for most of these on stream anyways and and this one's interesting a lot of speedrunners do this and I couldn't fully understand why but when a speedrunner is playing on the streets specifically on like legendary difficulty a lot of the time you will see them completely empty their magazine and make sure they're thrown all their grenades before they hit the next main level which eventually they'll come back to streets but what we decided to test out is why this is a thing that speedrunners do and it's actually really cool so the way we test this is we had Luke empty all of his magazines and throw all of his grenades where Dim and I only threw one grenade and only shot a little bit and what happened was after we played through the next level and we got back to streets Luke spawned in with max ammo and max grenades while Dim and I just had whatever we had left over from the previous time we were on streets so that's a little cool trick to get a full set of ammo and weapons and grenades going into streets if you ever play on legendary difficulty now we've talked about acrophobia speedruns on this channel before since we run acrophobia and ODST there's a lot of glitches that you can do with the acrophobia skull but 
a lot of these glitches also can be done without the acrophobia skull and they're really unique for instance barrier breaking is a really big one that's used to get out of various levels like for instance on a coastal highway speedrunners usually skip majority of this level by launching a warthog out of bounds onto this ramp over here and then doing a barrier break now the big thing that i didn't know for a long time when trying to learn barrier breaking is that it does matter if your odst is touching the barrier or the warthog is touching the barrier before you do the barrier break if either or both are touching the barrier a lot of the time it won't let your odst pass through the barrier and instead you kind of get stuck in this like awkward forceful push down but if you are backed up away from the barrier and then you speed into it you can then jump out of the warthog at the top of the barrier and push through it it's weird trying to figure out how to maneuver around something that you can't actually see but once you're able to do that you can pretty much access a large portion of coastal highway and then if you know all the load triggers you can progress to the level the way speedrunners do but nonetheless it's a really cool way just to get out of bounds on this level you can even see the blown up oni building that is a little underwhelming in this version but hey at least you can go see it on coastal highway on uplift reserve there's another trick that can be used where you take a warthog and you push it up against this barrier doing the same exact trick you just have to make sure you get it on your first try or else you'll just get pushed down and you won't be able to do the trick again more than likely without wasting a bunch of time but it is interesting because in this example we can see what happens if you get back in the warthog after it's already broken through the barrier and it is kind of hilarious it just slams into a rock at high speed also there's a way you can do this glitch as well like we do in acrophobia to just get out of the map but without using acrophobia which involves a bunch of really well-timed grenade throws that's very impressive not something i think i'll ever learn how to do but i do have to give credit that is an amazing trick to pull off on uplift reserve that speedrunners have been able to do for the individual level runs then on firefight if you look at lost platoon there's another section where you can do the same exact glitch using a warthog except there's a little bit more to it you have to kind of drive your warthog over some rocks get up to this corner and then you can either use your warthog to launch yourself out of bounds or you can use grenades to launch yourself to the top of the map or rockets to launch yourself at the top of the map if you alter your health in the firefight settings and you can access the same out of bounds area more or less that you can in uplift reserve going over to kikowani station there is a trick that has kind of existed in multiple halo games at this point but it is known as slinky flipping which essentially is a way to quickly turn your banshee and roll at the same time to move faster than just normal flying this glitch works in halo 2 and 3 as well but it also is here in odst over on kikowani station there are multiple ways to get out of bounds on this level despite there being invisible sky barriers trying to keep you in the level otherwise we just kind of fly straight to the end every time we play this level but there are ways you can break around this now there are tricks you can do with a phantom where you park your banshee in a specific way to break through the barrier or you can even do it without a banshee which has been done in acrophobia runs which is pretty impressive but my favorite way to do it is taking the banshee up to this corner flying it up boosting and then putting the nose down wrapping around this little ledge and then leaping out giving you access to the outside section of this level though kikawani station is really interesting because there's a lot of really interesting things you can do with the loading systems on this level depending on what loads you end up triggering you can cause the level to soft lock all together like we did here at the end of our run on kikawani and we just were kind of stuck in this room where nothing could progress or you can hit certain loads and have the level move along like normal there's one load that you have to jump through an invisible void type mirror lens texture that's just there because the back half of the level hasn't loaded and that's pretty cool or if you fly overhead you can find the exact place where you can stand on top of the building to load in the section and it's kind of cool to be able to manipulate the map itself loading and unloading zones in such a large open area there's a classic trick that works across multiple different halo games specifically halo 3 and halo 3 odst but if you stand on top of your friend in co-op and your friend starts jumping while you're in a corner and you're walking looking down you can do an elevator jump and elevate yourself up various surfaces but on terry plaza these shields you can actually climb up by using this trick then from there a lot of these shields actually have a soft barrier preventing you from dropping down to the other side but there is a little hole that's invisible at the very center of the barrier where if you jump up on your friend you can jump over and get access to the out of bounds section on terry plaza and other levels as well we were able to actually do the first part 
part of the trick pretty easily getting on top, but we were having trouble getting over the barrier until we just randomly fell through the barrier. Yeah, we don't know if we had hit the trigger that let us bypass the barrier already, or if maybe this barrier was just broken, but getting through this one was a lot easier. Now, this also is very helpful in acrophobia speedruns, because if you know there's an invisible hole in the middle, you can just fly yourself right through them, which later on in Teari Plaza, you can use acrophobia or just the old way of doing this glitch and fly through the invisible barrier and get to the other out of bounds sections. Acrophobia is a little more fun though, because then you can fly way out of the sky barrier and see Teari Plaza's loaded areas from a completely different angle. We actually did this on Teari Plaza and went over to where Romeo's drop pod is supposed to have crashed. And it's just this void area. And we also went over to where those creepy pillars from ODST's Mombasa streets at night are, and they're a little less creepy during the daytime. This glitch also works on Mombasa streets where you can fly completely out of bounds and you can manipulate loads along the way. We did this and we were able to fly all the way over to where the Oni building is and fly over the barrier to get over there. And it's interesting just looking at this section of the level at night, especially all on fire and whatnot. This trick also works on Kazingo Boulevard and can be helpful in co-op speedruns. And even if we go back to Teari Plaza, you can see some of the weird spawning mechanisms if you use this to go through the level too quickly, like how this phantom will just appear and disappear depending on what part of the load you're in. Typically, if you're playing through Halo 3 ODST's story, you know how you have to do the little tutorial at the beginning of the level prepare to drop. Though, if you throw the blind skull on, the game doesn't know how to load in the text that's supposed to be on the screen because your HUD is gone and it bypasses that whole section. This next one is a glitch, though so many different factors can trigger it to happen, but essentially phantoms in Halo 3 ODST sometimes just act really weird. Yeah, I don't know. If you play through Uplift Reserve too quickly, either driving your Warthog or Ghost straight through the level as fast as you can, or you are flying with Acrophobia, sometimes the game just gets overwhelmed with the audio cues it's supposed to play, and sometimes the audio will start overlapping, and it sounds really funny. If you can break through the barrier of the map, either using grenades or Acrophobia, you can find this pointless cave on Uplift Reserve. I remember us finding this and thinking it was the coolest thing ever. I know it's not that cool, but hey. General Kid, way back in the day found a really cool trick where you can break out into the main menu out of bounds section and navigate around the little area from the opening cutscene. That's pretty neat. Now typically on NMPD HQ you can't actually hijack any of these banshees except one of them. For whatever reason this one banshee is hijackable if you do a perfect kill and hijack. On Data Hive when you're playing co-op if one player is going too fast or gets too far ahead while the other players are going too slow there's a chance that they can soft lock in the void and just be stuck in like a wall somewhere not sure how to move forward. If you're traveling out of bounds and you're playing Halo 3 ODST co-op there's a chance that your teammate might need to respawn on you and the game won't know where to respawn them so just it respawns them in a death barrier infinitely and they'll just instant respawn over and over and over again because for whatever reason MCC has an extra bug that causes co-op players to respawn instantaneously rather than the one to two second delay in literally every other Halo game. On Kazingo Boulevard, regular speedrunners do this, but you can also do a frame perfect kill and hijack on a Banshee and hijack a Banshee on Kazingo Boulevard. There's an achievement even for doing that. You can even use that Banshee to glitch out of the map over here and bypass this door. If you get a bunch of elite bodies together and you get a ton of grenades to explode at the same time, usually by killing your buddy or whatever and having them drop their grenades. If you throw all your grenades down and make a massive explosion you can actually overload the game which will cause the elites to lose a falling death animation and revert back to their combat evolved equivalent death animation because technically this is still an evolution of that same combat evolved engine and they look haunted and that was something we thought might be haunted for a really long time it wasn't it was just the game being funky there was also the haunted beeping room that when we were searching for answers to the glyphs everyone thought there was something mysterious that would happen because for whatever reason if you glitched through this this specific door, you would hear a beeping sound as if you went through the door normally. And why would they program a beeping sound into a door that you're not supposed to go into? It turns out that it's not that deep. It's just in the firefight version of that map, enemies can spawn in there and run out and it makes the beeping noise so you know that there's an enemy coming that direction. But still, we thought it was haunted, but you can glitch through the door and go into this room if you want to. This next one's not a glitch, but it's a continuity error and I've wanted to talk about it for a while and I haven't had the right time to. But if you're on the daytime version of Mombasa and you go over to this corner there's graffiti here but on the nighttime version that takes place just a couple of hours later the graffiti 
he's not there, which means someone must have come in there and cleaned the streets and removed some graffiti while the Covenant was invading. If you go into theater mode and you watch the rookie jump out of his pod, you can see the way they pulled this animation off and it's by duplicating the rookie for a very brief moment and it's kind of funny to look at from this third person perspective. I know we have quite a few acrophobia glitches on here, but some of these are really cool. Like for instance, on Oni Alpha Site, if you fly up this side of the wall, there is a kill barrier up in the sky, but there is also a random chance that the kill barrier just won't kill you. And you can just fly straight up the side of the building and skip a large part of this level. I just really like this glitch for whatever reason. Mind you, to make the level progress correctly, you do have to hit a load trigger on the inside of the elevator shaft, which in a way is another glitch because that trigger being hit early causes a phantom in a completely different section spawn in, which is kind of cool. We're not really sure if this next one counts as a glitch, but on NMP DHQ, when you're in the firefight section at the end and you're holding off against banshees and phantoms, there is a way that you can correctly kill all of the banshees in a specific order and then the phantoms to minimize the amount of time it takes for the next wave to spawn in, meaning you can fly through this firefight incredibly fast if you work with your team to correctly kill the enemies in the right order. That's something to do with the way that the game checks for certain things before loading in the next section, and if you do it right, you can save a ton of time. This next one's really funny, but on Data Hive, right after you kill all of the brutes before Virgil's door, wherever Dare is, if she says the line, wow, you do know your stuff, and then right afterwards is airborne, the door will immediately open up, letting you go earlier, instead of you having to wait for Dare to get to the door. If whatever reason she says the line and she's not airborne, you will have to wait for her to go to the door. So I don't know why this is a thing, but it is a thing. Back on NMPD HQ during that firefight, if you kill the last phantom too quickly that drops off the wave of brutes, the level will just soft lock. You can't move forward because the game's wanting you to kill the brutes that you've already killed, so yeah, don't do that. Also, in the second wave of that firefight, this phantom comes in, and if you hit the engine enough times, but you don't blow it up, the phantom will just drop off all of the enemies straight off the map to their death, and that's always kind of funny. Also, on NMPD HQ, if you kill the phantom that's flying away a little too late, for whatever reason, you can cause the level to softlock some of the time. I don't really know how this one works, but I've had it happen to me enough times to be wary of it. On Coastal Highway or Data Hive, you can stand on the engineer and whether you're standing towards the front or towards the back, you can make Virgil move forward really quickly. It's kind of like a weird gas pedal and brake. So in a way you can steer and fly Virgil by standing on him. Now there is another glitch that can happen where his tentacles start going nuts. And if you stand too close to them, they can kill you. So be careful there. On Coastal Highway, if you're doing the out of bounds glitch where you're loading in the sequences of the level, there is a chance you can miss a load, but still trigger another load that has Dare and Virgil in the dump truck moving forward. And they'll just fall through the map and eventually fall to their death, which makes you revert to the last checkpoint. Also on Coastal Highway, if you did glitches to get to the end of the level, there is a chance that the last phantom will crash into the scarab, flip upside down, and drop the hunters off in a place where you can't get them. Now there's a chance they could fall to their death, which will actually save you time if you're a speedrunner, or there's a chance that they'll fall in a place where you can't kill them and softlock your game, ruining your entire speedrun. Also, if you kill the jackal wave too quickly, you can cause the hunters not to spawn in at all, thus also softlocking you here on this level. Sometimes on Data Hive, your random police officer that's with you might randomly decide to walk all the way back to the beginning of the floor that you drop down to when you're on the last floor with him. It can be really annoying. It's probably because you missed some sort of load that he typically walks into some of the time and really wants to go back to say his line and will stop at nothing to go back and say the line. But during this process of backtracking, he can actually despawn some of the enemies, which is cool, I guess. Sometimes Mickey's pathing will get messed up on Oni Alpha site and he'll just be running back and forth at the edge of the bridge before it blows up. There's a few places in Halo 3 ODST where if you're not where you're supposed to go, the game will force teleport you to where you're supposed to be, even if you're not even playing co-op. This is really interesting to me because it's like, hey, no, don't be there, be here instead. This will happen on Oni at the beginning of the level, where if you're on the other side of the bridge after it blows 
blows up. Whether you're playing co-op and you're left behind or you flew in Acrophobia over there, the game will force you back to the side you're supposed to be on. And later on in the level, when the police officers are talking, if you're not close to the center area, they'll teleport you close to the center area while they're having the dialogue about blowing up the building. On Data Hive, this will also happen if you're supposed to drop down when the buggers are coming in or you find a way to stop yourself from dropping in or you have a teammate who's not dropped in, the game will force you down below. And on Coastal Highway, if you don't hit your loading zones correctly, it will forcibly put you inside of the level over and over and over again. I don't know if we actually have footage of this one, so if you don't see it on screen now, just bear with us. But way back when MCC was bringing Firefight into the game, there was this weird glitch that kept happening to us where it would name random locations that we were in as the equivalent Firefight locations in theater, and the text would just look really bizarre. On the level Prepare to Drop, there is some really cool clips that you can do through various doors if you're playing co-op. There's these doors that are just down here if you're doing normal co-op, or you can clip through this wall if you're doing Acrophobia by timing your teammate dying and bumping them through the wall when they respawn. Similarly with Acrophobia, there's no barrier here for whatever reason, so you can fly right up here. I think you could also elevator jump if you wanted to as well. And then you could do the same bumping trick on the outside or inside of this window to clip your way in, and then later on on the streets level, you can clip your way out the same way. There is a very random chance on Kikawani Station that if you shoot at the squid house, they just won't have the chain reaction blow up that ends the level. Yeah, I don't know why. Also, there's a random chance that when you're playing on Coastal Highway, Virgil will just randomly explode. Yeah, I don't know why that happens. Also on Coastal Highway, if you've ever wanted extra rocket launchers, there is a way you can manipulate the loads of the level and grab rockets, go to a load zone, then head back through the load zone and get more rockets so that everyone in co-op can have rockets if you're not doing the deja vu challenge that has rockets there. There is a way that you can super launch Dare elephant in case you've ever gotten fed up on Coastal Highway. And there's also a way that you can get a phantom completely stuck on Uplift Reserve. There's these secret rooftops that you can walk along on NMPD HQ or on Windward. And then of course there's the pointless ledge down here that you're not supposed to get down to, but I like to just walk around and maybe team kill a little bit while we're down here. If you look down the elevator shaft on Oni Alpha site, you can actually see some Da Vinci textures plastered down here. And I don't know if this one counts, but the catch skull is supposed to apply to enemies throwing more grenades, but I think it applies to the ODSDs too. And it can be really funny to watch Mickey on Oni Alpha site just going ham with grenades. Like I said, I don't know if this counts as a glitch, but it is funny. On Coastal Highway, you can actually skip waiting for the engineer to open up this door to take you to the highway if you do a perfectly timed respawn bump where one player is walking into the middle of the door and another player or two die. And when they respawn, it blocks one respawn point allowing another player to respawn on the other side of the door, which instantly triggers the next part of the level. If you play Halo 3 ODST on PC, there is a guaranteed chance that if you're on an NVIDIA GPU, your game will crash during this scrolling text at some point. It doesn't have to happen the first time, but I guarantee if you play ODST enough times, it will happen to you inevitably. You can actually aggro a brute to chase you down, and while he's chasing you down, if you turn your back to him, you can use his smacks to push you forward and give you a bit of a speed boost. On Teari Plaza, there's some really awesome pressure boosts that players do when they're speedrunning this level, where they'll purposely knock down grenades and use the crates to push them into the ground and boost their ODST along. On both Oni Alpha Site and Kazingo Boulevard, if you have flame grenades and you throw them right here at the bottom of the wraiths when they're being dropped in by phantoms, you can actually cause them to explode prematurely before they're even dropped off. On the level Data High, when you are running along as fast as possible. If everybody stares down the end of the elevator shaft at the end, there's a chance that you can have this level end faster than what it normally would. And also when you're supposed to navigate Dare and the engineer back up to where Buck is and then down another floor, if you hit them with the gravity hammer, you can cause Dare to get stuck in a corner and that'll actually help you later on in the level where you don't have to wait for them to walk their way all the way over. They'll just instantly respawn at the door where they're supposed to
used to if this glitch gets done correctly. There's this cool little head jump space on Data Hive as well if you've ever wanted to just go up into this little upper area you're not supposed to be in. You gotta use the butterfly trick, but hey, it still works here. This door on Mombasa Streets is just randomly the wrong type of door. There's a chance that in Firefight, a jackal might accidentally do some sort of crazy super bounce. I don't know, this one's sort of a glitch, I guess. There is a way that you can hijack a wraith by doing the perfectly timed kill and hijack. And on Uplift Reserve, if you're fast enough, you can drive a ghost right up a specific route on this cliff to jump across and get a huge time save when driving the ghost. You get to skip the whole side area where that main road is that you have to drive up onto. You can partially break out of the map on Chasm 10 and get over to the second section that's from the campaign that you're not supposed to be over, but you're really limited with how far you can go. And it's just kind of funny that there's this really pointless area that you can get yourself stuck in. On Uplift Reserve, if you go the fastest way out of bounds where the whole level is deloaded and you get to the end of the level and walk around, you can actually just see a texture sheet of a picture of what the streets are supposed to look like instead of the actual streets themselves. And also with that instant respawning glitch, even if you're playing solo, if you're flying or you die too quickly on Terry Plaza, the game doesn't know what to do if you hit the button at the same time and the camera just awkwardly zooms in and then it doesn't know where to go from there. Okay, and now it's time we can go and look at Halo 3, a game that defined a generation, originally releasing in 2007 for the Xbox 360. This game broke all kinds of records and was included in the re-release of Master Chief Collection in 2014. And to this day, Halo 3 is the oldest mainline Halo game that hasn't gotten a remaster yet. People keep holding out for a Halo 3 anniversary. I don't know if we'll ever get it, but let's go ahead and look at all of the iconic glitches that were featured in this game because Halo 3 was just really special when it came to this type of stuff. One really easy glitch that you can do in Halo 3's Forge mode is actually get through walls that you're not supposed to get through. Now, back in the day, we used to do this by putting down a machine gun turret and have one player jump into the machine gun turret while another player is holding it in forge mode and then clip the player through a window or a fence or something like that. It works great on the map foundry and then the player on the machine gun turret just presses up on the d-pad and boom they're through on the other side. They could then put a teleporter down and you're able to walk around over in this little area. Can't go too far but this glitch also worked in a couple of other maps and you could get into some really interesting sections of Halo 3 maps in this unique way. Now, in the Master Chief Collection, when they updated Forge and gave players the ability to phase objects, you can hold an item, switch it to phased mode, and use that as a really cool way to clip through these same walls, but you can do it by yourself and it's much faster and more effective, so now there's an even easier way to go explore the outer areas of the map until you inevitably randomly explode or die. This is what a lot of speedrunners end up using, or if if you're just trying to trick in Halo 3, but you can use a deployable cover as a way to launch yourself by throwing a deployable cover down and kind of doing this side step forward step type thing at the right time. And once you get it down, you can just launch yourself in a direction, which is pretty neat. In various campaign levels of Halo 3, or in some cases multiplayer, if you're with a friend, you can do a really unique way of buddy jumping where one person stands in a straight corner and walks forward while the other player jumps on their head and repeatedly spams the jump button. And if this is done correctly, for whatever reason, both players are lifted up along the corner almost as an elevator. Nowadays, you can just use the Acrophobia Skull, but there is something unique about doing this in this manner instead. This next one is one we talk about quite a bit on this channel, so we won't dwell on it as much. For the very interesting physics engine that Halo 3 has, in order to keep the player model with all of the armor intact whenever a very very fast moving object hits the player and the dead body has this unique ragdoll momentum. Sometimes the limbs will stretch out a bit and it can be really hilarious to see. You can go and just do this in Forge mode for a bit and then switch into theater and watch in slow motion. And you can just see your Spartan stretch out in ways you never really thought would be possible. And it's not something you typically catch or you might just notice in a quick split second when you're playing the game, but theater mode just makes it all that much better. At the end of Sierra 117, when the pelican that comes by to pick you up is flying over. If you time a sticky grenade and throw it perfectly in where the pilot is, you can actually kill the pilot and the entire pelican will crash and it'll lock you out of beating the level. And you just have to kind of stand there awkwardly until you reset.
reset to last checkpoint. But still, it's kind of hilarious. On Crow's Nest, you can actually escape from the map if you jump on this platform and quickly jump onto the turret of the Phantom before it flies away. It'll actually start to fly away and then get stuck. But if you have another player counterbalancing the Phantom, you can get a little bit further out and you can jump off of the Phantom turret and use this to glitch outside of the map, which is really cool. Now, the neat thing about this is doing this glitch will get you out of the barrier that typically stops players from exploring beyond this area. And then you can journey all the way down here. Now, if you have another player playing within the level, go to the command room where you're supposed to go after this section and Miranda Keys starts talking. Her player model will just spawn right here and she'll start talking and she'll also be on the camera screen for the other player. And if you kind of walk in front of Miranda Keys, you can even get on camera and your friend could see you on the big screen in the command room, which is absolutely hilarious. On the level, the storm, you can actually get another player to jump inside this dumpster with you if you tip it over the right way. And if both players start spamming the A button at the right time and kind of get in sync, you'll feel your player lock into this idle falling animation inside of the dumpster. And from there, by spamming the A button, you can actually fly the dumpster together. And to an extent, you do have some control over which direction it goes based on how much you're hitting the A button. Over on the arc, there's actually a really cool glitch you can do and a glitch that a lot of speedrunners do where after the forward unto dawn flies in, you can use the ghost to get outside of the map and speed along in a much faster manner. And it just looks really cool. There's been a huge mystery in the Halo community for quite a few years where if you do some interesting glitches where you either go out of bounds or you do some time traveling stuff or you just kind of journey up on some side stuff, you can actually see this random red elite spot on. And there was a mystery for a long time as to who this red elite is, why he's here, and why is he randomly set to spawn in here just out of the blue. And people want to know what he's doing here. So interestingly enough, this elite trick is actually a result of a despawn that happens when you do a time traveling type trick on this level, or you go out of bounds in this section. And essentially you can, by journeying outside the map and messing with the spawns, cause it so all vehicles won't end up spawning in that spawn in a lot of the enemies and the friendlies. We've done this trick before where all of the brutes just fall from the sky where the phantom is supposed to fly in and drop them off. And as it turns out, when you play through this level normally, as you're going into the final section, there is a friendly phantom that flies in giving you cover. And one of the elites on that phantom is a red elite on the turret. So it looks like this mystery ended up being solved by figuring out that this red elite spawns because his phantom didn't spawn and he likely just fell from the sky and ran randomly landed there when the glitch was activated. Now, of course, there's a lot of other uses for this time travel glitch. We actually managed to find a way where if towards the beginning section still of the level, right after hitting the first tower and activating the switch, before you make your way back to the beach to do the whole pelican part, you can actually drive your ghost over this wall to the end section of the level. And if you work together with your team and line up things correctly, you can travel back over to the other side of the map and land close enough within walking distance of the third tower. And as long as you work together with your teammates to hit the triggered load zones, then die and respawn on your teammates, you can bypass this whole section of the Hornet without actually having to use the Hornet to beat this level. On the last level, Halo, if you fly too quickly and go right to where Sergeant Johnson comes out and where you typically go later on in the level after defeating Guilty Spark, you can actually lock yourself in this room if you fly up there and stand in the room and the door closes on you. And uh, there's really nothing you can do then. You're just stuck there. But hey, it's a glitch. Also, a lot of you may know that Sergeant Johnson has an unlimited Spartan laser where if you kill him and you take his Spartan laser and then you kill him again and you take his new Spartan laser, that Spartan laser has unlimited ammo and it's pretty cool. But in the process of killing him, he'll pick up whatever weapon is nearby. And if you give him, say, a gravity hammer, something that doesn't have a Sergeant Johnson animation with it, he'll just not take the gun and run down there and start fighting the flood with his fists. And it's pretty hilarious to watch. There's also a way you can keep Johnson alive where you can kill him at the right time right before you activate the final boss fight and when you come out of fighting Guilty Spark he'll just be waiting there despite everything that just happened in the cutscene. Now from there it becomes a lot trickier because you do have to work really hard to try to keep him alive and while it's not something we've been able to do there have been other people like General Kid who've managed to keep Johnson alive and push him all the way through the level to where the Warthog is and keep Johnson alive through the end of the game. Also on Halo, if you go into this middle room that you could lock yourself in 
in earlier and you play through this section just like normal, if you get to the part where the flood pods explode before you would typically walk your way up to the exit, there's a loading zone there that you can hit and if you back travel to where the door was, the door now has this weird smear effect even though it's not supposed to deload that section until after you move a little bit further along. So the door is just kind of looking like that, all weird. This is something that happens in a lot of different instances across the Halo games, but especially in Halo 3, where if you go too far forward and then backpedal or you just go to a place you're not supposed to go, you can see just the textureless void just out there. And it's kind of terrifying, but also kind of cool. There's actually quite a few areas on the last level Halo that you can access during the Warthog run that you're not really specifically supposed to go to. We did a bunch of these when we were trying to complete this on foot and just tried to find these areas that we would journey up to. Going around some of these side sections or up on the indoor interiors where you typically just drive through real quick, it is kind of cool just to see a different perspective of this level's layout. Now if you activate the cowbell skull and the tilt skull, you can actually launch yourself way up in the air with the warthog by timing some grenades. From there, the possibilities of what you can explore up on top of this mountain are quite a bit different, but still really awesome to do. Okay, a lot of you guys probably know this one, but on Sandbox, typically when you're running around on this map, if you go out into the dark section of the desert, these giant laser beams of the Guardian will just gun you down relentlessly. It's actually almost hilariously aggressive how quickly they gun you down. But back in the day, there were solutions figured out to bypass this a bit and have a little bit of creative fun when you want to forge a cool map. Essentially, if you overload the map, typically done by throwing a bunch of trip mines and have the trip mines set on a minimum spawn of one, so you keep picking up new ones and throwing them down constantly. Eventually, parts of the map will despawn, the grid will go away, and from there, you're free to just drive around the map, see the darkest parts of the desert that you want to see, kind of have some fun. It used to be a really easy way to get the skull, though nowadays in MCC, you have to kind of set up some teleporters where the skull is supposed to be, because the skull just despawns whenever we do this, and then you have to start a new round and go over there and grab it, but it still works just differently. But yeah, this map ends up being a huge playground to play on, and there's actually a lot of forgers who figured out how to block those giant laser beams for custom games by utilizing this glitch in the first place. And that's something that ended up making a lot of those custom games back in the Halo 3 days a lot of fun because you had this huge, massive, literal sandbox to play in. Speaking of little areas to play in, there's this glitch you can do on Avalanche that gives you access to this little area just outside of the map and you can forge stuff. Some people have made some cool monster truck maps on Avalanche, which is just a nice change of setting considering Halo 3 only had a few different settings that worked in these types of games. Similar to the forge glitch we talked about earlier where you could go through those windows on Foundry, Rat's Nest is another great place this glitch comes in handy. There's a couple of different areas that you can access by doing a clip through the wall. Like there's this room up here there's a nice view of the cliff, but you can't get out of the room once you get in there unless you have teleporters set up. This became an iconic place in games like Cops and Speeders, where if you got arrested, you had to do your time up in this jail cell, and it actually kind of worked as a jail cell because you were locked in there, and if they blocked your teleporter, you couldn't get out, so we've spent a lot of time in there. There's other glitches that are classic glitches, of course, like the AA Wraith in Halo 3. This is one that people figured out how to do way back in the day, but essentially by killing the brute driver with a melee and timing jumping in perfectly, you can take over the AA Wraith and just drive it around and use it to your heart's content, and that's awesome. You can also, in Sand Trap, you can use various different tools to kind of hook the elephants in Forge Mode and fly them around way higher up in the map than you're supposed to. And a lot of us ended up flipping our elephants and we would see that Easter egg asking how on earth you managed to flip this elephant. But hey, it was something really cool, and the fact that you could just fly these elephants with a simple Forge glitch was neat too. On the level of the Covenant, if you have Acrophobia Skull on and you're just flying through the map way too quickly. When you get to the first tower, if you fly too fast up the elevator and get up to where all the brutes are, they'll actually just chill there for a while and just not attack. We just thought it was kind of interesting to find a bunch of brutes vibing. In Halo 3 on the Ark, if you are quick enough and you grab lift up onto the Scarab, you can ride the Scarab outside of the main play area, and if you blow up the Scarab out of bounds, some creepy stuff might start to happen with your Scarab. It's almost like these legs just come to life and they want to splatter you angrily and it's terrifying. It's honestly a pretty fun glitch just to do and it's not that hard to do especially now with the acrophobia skull you can just fly into the scarab and destroy it out of bounds and also you'll soft lock your game if you do this so remember you can't progress after you've killed the scarab too early. This next glitch we still don't have footage of because we don't know how to recreate it but one time we were playing on crow's nest and if for whatever 
reason you get the timing just perfectly in respawning a player, there's a chance that one player will respawn outside of the elevator at the end of the level right before the elevator drops down and they just stand in the big flaming explosion outside in the hangar area and uh, everything just turns black. I had this happen to me one time. Nothing really happens. You just get this fire effect on your screen and then everything else looks mostly the same, but it is a little weird of an experience to have. Also on Crow's Nest, there's this other really odd glitch where at the beginning of the level where the warthog explodes that has all of the marines on it. If you're fast enough, you can jump into the driver's seat of that warthog and just sit there in the exploded warthog. The only problem is we've tried this so many times and we cannot pull it off. We're just not fast enough to get into that warthog in time before the explosion happens. The only reason that we know this is even possible is because there's this old video from like 12 years ago of someone who managed to pull it off. And ever since then, we've been trying to do it and we just can't pull it off. Also later on in this level, when you typically go through the barracks where all the brutes are, you can skip this whole section by doing a launch that essentially involves you pushing this vent cover up against this wall here and hitting it just right with a gravity hammer, which then pushes against your character and causes this launch to happen that causes you just to fling a massive distance and you can actually clear the gap and get all the way over to the elevator and not die. On Sierra 117, you can actually fly across using the Acrophobia Skull, this giant gap, and get to where Sergeant Johnson is early, though it actually soft locks the level as there's a bunch of triggers that cause the level to move forward located up on the bridge. Though you can also use the Acrophobia Skull to fly quickly up into one of the Phantoms, you can actually ride in the Phantom outside of the map's soft barrier and get outside of the map that way and kind of see off into the sunset and see a little bit more of this level that you're not supposed to actually get to go and visit. Similarly, this glitch can be done actually in a lot of different places in Halo 3. For instance, Savo Highway, you do the same thing with the Phantom and get up to an area outside of the map that you weren't supposed to typically go to. You can even do this one without the Acrophobia Skull using a grav lift and moving quickly. There's this whole big out of bounds section you can explore up on the mountains. And also at the end of this level, if you quickly destroy the shade turret and then destroy the barrier and drive to the end of the tunnel, you can actually cause all of the brutes to despawn, ending the level early without actually having to kill the brutes. In general, breaking out of the map on the storm was always an interesting endeavor, which became a lot easier with the addition of the Acrophobia Skull. It is always a little weird to see what the area looks like if you fly outside of the map. There is this weird door over here that nobody really knows the whole reason that it was there. There's a ton of speculation to this day, but yeah, there's this mysterious door that you can see through the walls here. The Acrophobia Skull definitely was one of those skulls that just was a gift that kept on giving and it let us explore the end area of Floodgate outside of the map and this whole area is really interesting because there's a ton of places you can go and the way that the visual effects just kind of start to cause these streaking lines with these flame flares or something it just looks really cool and it's one of the easiest and coolest visual glitches in Halo 3. On the arc there's this really complicated glitch that you can do to get inside of the cutscene room that takes place in the command room which you can access by glitching into this specific rock. Now it is interesting that the command room is placed inside of this rock and typically it's really challenging to get into here to even see it. Also with the Acrophobia Skull on the arc if you fly too quickly and bypass the enemies you can skip some major load zones and cause yourself to softlock where just all of a sudden nothing starts to load in and you can't really progress or do anything. It's a little bit awkward until you go back and figure out how to trigger the load zones again but if you go too far ahead past the doors they won't open again and you're just stuck in this desert forever. Also real quick while we're at this point in the video I just want to give a huge shout out to Halo Creation for helping us with this video. Seriously, Halo Creation is easily the number one best French Halo community. They've been friends with our channel for a long time and helped us out with a ton of stuff. And while we know a lot of glitches in Halo 3, they know a lot more. <laughs> and they helped us pick some really interesting ones and they had really great documentation of it. So I just wanted to shout them out. There's a link in the description. Make sure you guys are subscribed to them because they put out some pretty banger videos. You don't want to miss it. Earlier in this video, we talked a little bit about getting to the bottom of the hangar area on Crow's Nest. And there's this older glitch that people did before. Acrophobia just made it easy called DC Surfing to get down there. And it kind of looks really fun. On the level The Covenant, you can get an unlimited amount of Marines by flying your Hornet a certain way. Honestly, it's kind of funny if you just fly your Hornet over here, just a Marine will spawn and drop you off another Hornet over and over 
and over again, it can get pretty ridiculous. And then you can have a little party with your marines and just a ton of hornets over at that second tower, because why not? On various maps like Sierra 117, Crow's Nest, or Savo Highway, if you end up doing a glitch or a series of glitches to ride the Phantom off into the sunset, sometimes you can actually just crash the Phantom, and then you can just kind of get stranded in some random place and try not to throw up at the smear effect texture. Another great glitch is one that Halo Creation definitely has a lot of fun with, but they play Halo 3, they throw on Cowbell, they throw on the Tilt Skull, and those two skulls combined can do some really interesting things, like just launch yourself in the air as high as you could possibly imagine, and they have definitely have done that quite a few times, especially here on the Ark. It's pretty great to see. I've tried to master the launching of the Spartan myself, and I struggle to get the footing right, but it's always really awesome when you do pull it off. In Halo 3 Forge, there's a few different Forge tricks you can do, sometimes involving kill balls, sometimes involving manipulating spawns, to get various vehicles in Halo 3 to spawn without having an actual turret or gun on them, like the Warthog or in this case the Wraith. Also, some people might know there's a launch you can do at the end of the Covenant to get to the Prophet of Truth quicker, and while that trick's awesome, if you throw on Cowbell and Tilt, it becomes even awesomer until uh, it's no longer viable for getting past that part of the level because you went way too far, but still. Once again, with Tilt and Cowbell, and this time a Banshee, you can do a Gravity Hammer Banshee launch and actually make your way to the very top of one of the towers. And if you're playing on Savo Highway solo only, but with Tilt and Cowbell, you can actually get an infinite number of Warthogs and then take them out of the map while you're at it. Honestly, I think Tepic at Halo Creation maybe got a little too carried away with getting all the Warthogs together, because he got all the Warthogs together here. But I appreciate the art for the cause here, and we could respect Halo Creation for that. Okay, this next one's a really old one and a very pointless one, but it's one that I remember doing. I know a lot of other people probably did it, and maybe some of you completely forgot, but if you were just sitting on the main menu of Halo 3, taking in the atmosphere, enjoying the music, and then you just decided to like spam campaign and see how it would switch from like the wide view to like the close up on Master Chief and Arbiter, and then you just kept spamming the buttons to go back and forward over and over and over again. And if you did it quick enough, eventually the game would just kind of freak out and give you a new version of the main menu, which was just the Master Chief and the Arbiter close up, and it just would stop switching after a while. It just gave up, but it was an interesting glitch nonetheless, and one that I'm a little nostalgic for. So there's actually another way you can do the flying elephant glitch on Sand Trap, where instead of pulling it with the propane tank, you can just set a bunch of explosions off inside of it, and eventually it'll just start flying because the physics of the explosions enough to start giving the elephants a little bit of upward momentum, and the randomness of it helps too. So there you go. Okay, this next one's a really old one and a very pointless one, but it's one that I remember doing. I know a lot of other people probably did it, and maybe some of you completely forgot, but if you were just sitting on the main menu of Halo 3, taking in the atmosphere, enjoying the music, and then you just decide to like spam campaign, and see how it would switch from like the wide view to like the close up on Master Chief and Arbiter, and then you just kept spamming the buttons to go back and forward over and over and over again. And if you did it quick enough, eventually the game would just kind of freak out and give you a new version of the main menu, which was just the Master Chief and the Arbiter close up, and it just would stop switching after a while. It just gave up. But it was an interesting glitch nonetheless, and one that I'm a little nostalgic for. So there's actually another way you can do the flying elephant glitch on Sand Trap, where instead of pulling it with the propane tank, you can just set a bunch of explosions off inside of it, and eventually it'll just start flying because the physics of the explosions enough to start giving the elephants a little bit of upward momentum, and the randomness of it helps too. So there you go. Speaking of outside of the map glitches, on some of the newer maps introduced to Halo 3 in the MCC, you can do those classic Forge glitches once again to glitch outside of the map and explore around, which can be fun as there's three different maps. You're not 
fully able to just go anywhere, but still, you get to look around a little bit, and that's always fun. Also, on Crow's Nest, if you push Sergeant Johnson up far enough, and then you make sure he doesn't, like, wander off and get lost in the loadings of the game, you can actually end up with a couple of Sergeant Johnsons, just because they set up a new Sergeant Johnson to spawn in when you regroup with them later on. And just kind of interesting to have this, like, Spider-Man No Way Home moment, but with Sergeant Johnson. On Longshore, you can glitch up into this upper area of the map. There's not too much you can actually do up here, but look down at where they make the fish sticks. A lot of people used to try to glitch out of the map on Orbital back in the day, and it was a little bit harder back on the original Halo 3 because there's just so many death barriers everywhere. But now that MCC has the updated Forge tools, it is a little bit easier to get out there and walk around a couple of steps this time, at least before you fall to your death. I always also wondered about up here on Lockout. It just seems like a really cool secret area in these rooms up on this building. And while you can get up there and walk around in the room in Forge mode, the teleportation systems never actually worked. They would usually despawn. So it's always cool just to think that this is a really VIP exclusive room that you can't do too much in. But you know it's the VIP because not everyone can get in it. On the arc, there is a way that after you hit the little cutscene and you're supposed to go downstairs and then fight the rest of the brutes, that you can move a little bit forward in the level, then backtrack and take out all of the brutes once they've spawned in from up above and possibly even drop down and survive. I've done it before, but for whatever reason, every time I try to recreate the glitch and get footage for it, I can't do it. All my friends think I'm crazy, but trust me, this is a possible glitch, or at least it used to be possible in one of the updates, and for whatever reason, I can't do it anymore. But if anyone else can do it and prove to me that it is possible, would be my favorite person to send it to me on Twitter because I've been trying to show people that it is a glitch that's in Halo 3. I just don't know how to do it yet. As a result of some weird desync back in the OG Halo 3 days in matchmaking, every once in a while, one player might just accidentally or in some miraculous way splatter another player using only their body. I remember seeing these theater clips all over the place back in the day, and to this day, I still don't fully understand why this happens. I assume it has to do something with how there was peer-to-peer -peer hosting instead of server hosting, but it's interesting. By going into forge mode and putting down some ghosts and then changing the respawn time to 10 seconds and then also changing the minimum amount on the map, you can essentially duplicate a ghost that shares the same properties of a non-existent ghost and in turn you can make one ghost kind of have this anti-gravity effect to it while another person's in forge mode holding on to the opposite ghost. Sometimes in Halo 3, if you teabag the Prophet of Truth after the Arbiter kills him, his body will glitch through the floor and just fall. Also, by far one of the most annoying glitches that I've had happen to me is my gear in Halo 3, the original Xbox 360 Halo 3, randomly disappearing. I was so proud when I actually got the marathon set of armor in Halo 3 for getting 1,000 gamer score. And then just one day, it just it disappeared from my armory. I was pretty upset. I couldn't figure out how to get it back. I ended up just being an elite for a long time and was harassed relentlessly in custom games. And then just one day randomly later on, I got another achievement and the security armor came back and it never left again in the original 360. I was still wearing the security armor up until the last day of the Xbox 360 servers being live. On Floodgate, if you fly through the level too quickly with Acrophobia Skull on, when you get to this cutscene, you can occasionally just glitch out and shake around and look kind of funny. Back in the early days of Halo 3 Forge mode, before they did the big MCC update where you can just like phase and fix objects freely, which is really cool, you had to do a very different technique slash glitch if you wanted objects to float in the map or phase through other objects in the map. Essentially, you would have to stack all of your objects up and let them settle in place and then delete the objects beneath them. And if they were the right type of set piece, they could then float. And it was this long process and if you wanted to phase objects, you had to put each object on a timer to spawn in, start a new round, and quickly place the new object where it would overlap with the other object to make the two objects collide together and phase. It was super tedious, but something that a lot of us did way back in the day to build racetracks or cool looking structures, and we were pretty grateful when Reach introduced phasing and fixing objects later on. Also back in the original Halo 3, you couldn't actually play split screen camp pain with more than two people, and there was some glitches you could do by navigating through the menus so that you could get four player split 
split screen co-op actually working, which is kind of one of the coolest glitches and bypasses in Halo history. When Forge Mode came into MCC PC for Halo 3, there definitely were a lot of glitches and there still are some glitches, but there was a time we tried building in Forge Mode and just every time we placed a single object, we would explode. It definitely wasn't the greatest. Chinese MCC has a lot of the old glitches that were around during the earliest days of MCC when the game was completely buggy and broken. And it's always interesting to look back at this version of MCC and see some of those glitches like snowbound turrets not killing players. There was this weird skull in Halo 3's Cortana that may or may not have had a purpose. Something along the lines of maybe letting your weapon transfer over to the next level or something. There was a crashing error that could happen in Halo 3 where if you backtracked or you just stayed behind on Halo 3 after the rally point or after the main boss fight, the game will just crash because it didn't teleport the players forward before deloading that area. So the game just crashes here. Also at that same point, there's a rally point inconsistency that I haven't really fully been able to understand yet. And I'm not sure if this counts as a glitch, but I wanted to bring it up here because I don't know when I'll be able to have a chance to talk about this again. But essentially if you load in at rally point Bravo, that brings you in right after the boss fight, you spawn in with an assault rifle and a shotgun. Though if you play through the campaign level normally after beating the boss, it takes your weapons away and spawns you in with just an assault rifle, no shotgun. We did find a way to consistently break out of the map by this Easter egg over on the last level of Halo 3, where if you jump straight down, you die. But if you go around this way, you jump over here and then drop down, you can actually survive. There's not much to do down here, but hey, you're down here. We've talked about this glitch many times before. It was something involving Halo 2 being added to PC that somehow broke Halo 3 custom games. But in a custom game night, for whatever reason, it was glitched where some of us could control vehicles without being in the vehicles. We would just see our vehicles driving around. Dim started calling this car bending, which is hilarious and accurate. Back before we were able to just mod stuff on the PC and look around freely, there was a glitch you could do using theater mode, which would give you access to something called pan cam and let you explore beyond the barriers of the Halo maps. On the newer snow map waterfall in Halo 3, the pelicans aren't always in sync across players. And if you glitch out of the map and go explore that, sometimes you can stand on top of a pelican that's not there for other players. On Citadel, you can clip through the floor and find this secret Heidi room. And back in the day before we could fully explore outside of the maps in a lot of these multiplayer maps, players used to use teleporters to break out of bounds. And a lot of players found the most areas that you could push the boundaries of the map without getting instantly killed by utilizing teleporters on maps such as Valhalla, where you could go up the cliffside. We also did that on Construct to see what side areas we could go into. The Pit was another big map that players tried to glitch out of using various different methods, whether it was teleporters, respawn points, clipping with turrets. There were so many rumors about what was out there on this map, none of them which were true, but hey, it was a fun map to break out of. If you flew around in forge mode too much and switched between player and forge mode rapidly. Sometimes your momentum would carry over into your Spartan, but be in this downward thing. And after doing it too much, you would just launch down to the ground at very high velocities. You could also go into forge mode and grab a vehicle. And if your friend or something jumped in the passenger seat, you could kind of just ghost drive the vehicle and they would have no idea what was going on. I definitely had way too much fun with this, especially throwing the vehicle out of bounds with Dim in it. He, uh didn't stand a chance. Sometimes players were able to use some of the glitches in Halo 3 to make a game type. For instance, there was this whack-a-mole game type where all the players were in mongooses clipping through the floor and driving around while the infected would try to hit them with a hammer from above. It was actually really hilarious just playing this game type and the chaos that would ensue. And still, it's a really cool use of how glitches can be utilized to make a different type of gaming experience. On the level of the Covenant, if you have Acrophobia on, you can actually yeet yourself through this window and bypass a huge section of the campaign level. Though, it is interesting that maybe this could be utilized in one way or another to be used without acrophobia. That might be a big part of speedrunning one day if a survivable version of this trick ends up working.
working out. On the last level Halo, there's this little area you can crawl through the top to get a bigger and closer view to this laser room, which is kind of the equivalent room from Halo 1's two betrayals. And it was hard to get into back in the day, but with Acrophobia it's a little bit easier. But still, it's a nice little pointless glitched room that in a way pays homage to Halo Combat Evolves, same location. On Halo 3, the arc, if you fly really quickly, you can see this ship crashing, but if you're using Acrophobia, you can see it doesn't actually crash and there's this little visual glitch that takes it there. Also, while we looked at some of the soft locks from Halo 3's campaign, there's actually a bunch of other ways you can soft lock your game. We'll just go through them real quick. In CR117, there's this area where you can have these funky smear effect walls and it locks you in place over here by just flying forward and backwards again. On the level of the storm, if you drive a mongoose up to this door right when the scarab's coming, you can actually cause the entire scarab to despawn and then also cause some other weird map mishaps to happen. If you're messing around on the Covenant and you time travel to do various glitches, you can end up completely soft locked in this end area of the game. There's several different spots where you can be completely locked in, whether it's this little canyon or just the big open area. It's pretty tedious if you're trying to do something bigger and you end up getting yourself trapped here. There's also a ton of various glitches that will happen on the Covenant if you're messing around in the elevators, especially with the Acrophobia skull on. You either fly up too quickly or you hit a button and then you get off the elevator. It can cause your game to soft lock here as well and you can't progress any further or you get stuck in the upper area. Over on Crow's Nest, there's actually this secret room you can go in and lock yourself in there with your crew if you feel like it. General Kid, who's covered glitches for years and is a great friend of the channel, has done this before on his channel where he just has himself locked in this random room. It's kind of pointless, but hey, you're not supposed to be in there, so hey, it counts as a glitch. Also, on the Halo 3 level, the Covenant, you can get your Hornet out of bounds or out of the sky barrier that typically keeps you within the map by flying out to this third tower, dropping your Hornet down a bit, and then flying backwards and up beyond the barrier again. This gets you up into this higher area of the map that you can't normally or you're not supposed to normally get access to, and it also lets you fly around a little bit in a larger sense to explore and see what type of trouble you can get into. In some cases, you can even get into some mishaps with this tower that's over here where you can kind of glitch your way inside of it, which is something that we always thought was kind of interesting. Another great channel that we don't get to talk about enough on this channel and probably our favorite tricking Halo YouTubers is definitely Hidden Reach. They just find these random little hiding spots in the multiplayer games of Halo from over the years. And some of the things that they found through Halo 3, whether it's on The Pit or even on Last Resort, they're really clever spots that you're not supposed to normally get into that could serve for a pretty big advantage in multiplayer. They have a ton of content from over the years over on their channel. So make sure you guys check it out if you like to see these little nuanced hiding spots from Halo, because we like to see see them too. Back in the day when everyone was on their laggy Xbox 360s because there was always that one kid hosting in the lobby who did not have good internet. I don't know if he was playing on dial-up or maybe he didn't have the right type of N adapter in the back of his Xbox 360. Whatever the issue was, there was always these weird glitches that kept happening back in the day with weird network latency and some of the time you could just be dead inside of your own body in Halo and you won't respond for whatever reason. You're just experiencing life being a dead body watching everyone else run around and play and it was just kind of one of those interesting things that is sometimes still documented nowadays. If you mess around and forge a bit or you kind of have fun with a turret, you can actually launch a turret way up in the sky at hyper velocity and sometimes the glitching results are pretty hilarious. There's this whole trick you used to be able to do where you could stick a enemy player as they're jumping into a vehicle and then jump into their vehicle as they explode and the vehicle blows up and then boom, you're just laying in an empty vehicle and it's kind of funny. It's pointless, there's no real purpose to it, but hey, it's something that can happen. Also, when you're messing around in Halo 3 Forge, if you do the glitch where you grab hold of an item at the same exact time as someone else grabbing an item, you can do some really interesting manipulative things with the weapons while they're still in the hands of the players. This can involve some creepy spinning wrists at 100 miles an hour, or even some interesting new dance moves you didn't even know was a thing. I've played around with this one quite a bit, and it's always awesome whenever things get a little too out of hand, like helicopter arms, or, you know, your arms just straight up getting ripped off and disappearing for a while, and inevitably this usually ends up resulting in the game crashing. Also on Floodgate, when we were trying to get this glitch for the cutscene, we kept running into the level crashing over and over again. We think it might be related to running it with Acrophobia on, which is required to get the cutscene glitch, but for whatever reason when we we're trying to get footage of this, our game literally crashed like nine times in a row when we were going into co-op trying to make this happen. Yeah, we don't know why. 
something with acrophobia maybe this next one's one that we're working on for an upcoming video because we haven't fully figured out how it works but apparently there's another way you can just duplicate your marines on the storm and we're working on figuring this out because we want to do a test across a couple different halo areas where you can do marine duplications so we're working on this one but apparently you can get a lot of marines on the storm and that's worth counting so now let's go ahead and shift gears and take a closer look at halo 4. now this game released originally in 2012 on the xbox 360 and marked 343 industries debut with the halo franchise with a new development team working on halo games things were interesting when it came down to what type of glitches we would find now this game would also as with the other halo games be re-released alongside the master chief collection in 2014 so let's go ahead and take a closer look here on the level requiem if you press a button that puts you into this 3d model here you can actually jump into a ghost at the exact same time as you press the button you can turn invisible and no one will be able to see you also on this level if you park the banshee right next to the door on the bridge at a specific angle right when you hit the load for the next section of the level you can run backwards and grab the banshee which allows you to fly the banshee in this weird void space for whatever reason standing in this specific spot on forerunner will just launch you ridiculously fast on infinity and reclaimer you can get a launch from the tanks if you flip them because they end up interlapping your hitbox with the tanks hitbox i don't know the game freaks out and just launches you really quickly in halo 4 if you glitch into an area where you're standing in a spot that the level will then spawn in around you the game will just launch you in a random direction this comes up from time to time in speedruns. at the end of the level midnight after you defeat both towers you'll normally have to kill the three knights and then the light bridge here will spawn in but if you use the acrophobia skull like you want to explore something you can actually get launched up to the light bridge while it's invisible the cutscene trigger is still there and if you hit it the entire didact fight ends up happening on this invisible light bridge that never actually spawns in on the level dawn if you press this button while a teammate in co-op mode runs ahead into a load zone it'll teleport into void space on the level shutdown if two people hit this button at the same exact time one player will absolutely just become invincible we accidentally had this once when we were playing halo 4 and it was kind of hilarious there was no fall damage and i was able to just go places i definitely was not intended to go around in on the level composer you can have both waves in the end fight come in at the same time which ends up skipping a wave entirely all you have to do is start out by killing every enemy on the map to begin with then cortana will say another wave and when two more phantoms spawn in you blow up the left phantom and only kill the wraith driver not the wraith for whatever reason this delays a checkpoint and it interacts with a loading done at the same time and for some reason that causes the last two waves to come in at once on the level pitfall if you go into forge mode you can mess around with the teleporters a little bit and actually glitch out of the map here and go exploring this is one of my favorite halo 4 maps to go and explore and it's just interesting because there's these random rocks falling from the sky and there's not a lot of places you can legally go but you can put some things down to stand on but yeah it's just interesting how far out that this map actually lets you go this is an old one that not too many people actually knew about at the time but there is a co-op glitch you can do on the second to last level that gives you access inside of the mac gun and you can shoot it it's not as strong as halo reaches mac gun but hey at least we have a mac gun that we can access and it's kind of cool on the level reclaimer if you're a speedrunner and you move along too quickly here you can actually cause the entire mammoth to fall off of the map because you loaded in the next level of the map which deloaded the previous part of the map and the mammoth just falls into void space on the level midnight there's a trick you can do to fly out of bounds and you can kind of see this big open area it's pretty cool in itself but there's a speed running strategy that's used here where in co-op during the flying section if one person dies there's a chance that the game will just like freeze to one frame per second it's pretty weird though if this trick is done correctly and one player hits all the load zones correctly this whole section can be skipped altogether during a 2020 update for the master chief collection 343 industries randomly took the boxes of the dawn out of the game but only on console it wasn't there in the pc port making dawn skip for a period of time impossible for console runners it took like two years before they were randomly added back on shutdown once you get into a pelican if you turn the controller to the perfect axle dead zone on 
the analog stick. You can get the Pelican to fly diagonally, which is a speed running trick, which ends up making it fly faster than normal. You end up saving like 20 seconds rather than just flying in a straight line. On Halo 4's Composer, we don't know why this one happens, but for whatever reason, whenever I press a button here, if Luke was dead at the right or wrong time, sometimes it would cause another player to respawn and it would instantly crush the other player out of existence. Halo 4 is known for having this really long sequence in the first level Dawn. However, back in around 2016, there was a trick for co-op mode where you could do a triple head stack and glitch out of the map, therefore bypassing the back section of Dawn and beating the level early. However, in 2019, speedrunner Royal Hobo made a big discovery, putting together a solo method for completing Dawn using this method to get out of bounds and bypass the main level. Halo 4 Forge was actually one of those that was pretty fun to mess around with, surprisingly. And you guys say we never play Halo 4 enough. Well, here's a Halo 4 challenge. We tried to crash this one. Essentially, we were getting pretty close with just having a ton of stuff on the screen at the same time, lots of explosions, and just messing around with the Forge objects. But things got real wild when I started spawning in a grid and trying to force things to explode at the same time and respawn over and over again. And while we couldn't quite get it to crash and we knew we were getting close, we did succeed at letting Halo 4 crash when I started just spinning the grid like crazy, launching objects in the air, killing Luke multiple times, until finally Halo 4 just completely died on us and we were out of that one as well. On the level Requiem, we decided to just see what we could do with vehicles on this level. They give you such a short ledge that's pretty easy to bump a vehicle up and over with just a little bit of trying power. So before too long, we were going where maybe we weren't fully intended to go, but still definitely allowed to go on Requiem. And we even drove ourselves into this middle area and up into this building section. Now, after you're there for a minute, you do have to go and press a button and they actually will despawn all of the vehicles. Though, if you jump in the vehicle at the exact moment of the button being pressed, the vehicle will stay. Now, we couldn't pull it off with a Warthog. We did manage to get it with a ghost. So there was that, but even then, I mean, there wasn't really much we needed to do with that because we had already tested how far we could get past that. The rest of the level's pretty linear from there, but nonetheless, we were able to make it over that ledge and explore a little bit with a vehicle, a bit longer at least when it comes to Halo 4. And real quick, while we're mostly focusing on campaign, I was playing a Spartan Ops level and I got so frustrated because I'm going for the legendary solo achievement, which is just awful in itself, but there was a moment where one of the elites I was supposed to kill went flying when I shot him with a rocket launcher and landed up on the cliffs somewhere up here. This is just a recreation showing where it happened. And it was so frustrating frustrating because he was the last elite I needed to kill to beat it after spending about 30 to 45 minutes on this level and I could not get an angle on him for the life of me. He fell in some random little crack between three rocks and I couldn't lob any grenades up there to kill him. I couldn't do anything and I ended up having to reset and I'm still mad about this months later that I included it in this outline. And then this next one 100% does not count for this video but I had a theory and it kind of is related to the same thing at the same time. Not at all really but if for whatever reason someone is actually listening to this in a release of a video. It means Luke thought this was a dumb enough idea to include in the final release of the video and greenlit it. And for that, thank you Luke for not cutting this. But at the end of Halo 4, I have a really interesting theory on how Cortana actually was able to save Master Chief. And it's all based off of a texture. At the end, after Master Chief detonates the nuke, he's in this blue textured spherical area. And I suspect, if you've seen the Disney Pixar movie, The Incredibles, you know how Elastigirl can like extend herself into a parachute or whatever. I theorize that Cortana saved Master Chief by stretching her body out into a big flat and rounded sphere around Master Chief and then just duplicated herself to talk to him. But I just think this is such a hilarious visual if you think of it that way and therefore, it definitely is one of the most interesting visual things that have happened in all of the Halo franchise. Probably not canon, but in my head canon, that's how it happened. Now, when it comes to Halo 4, we also spent a ton of time with the game explicitly trying to see what would happen if we used the newly added Acrophobia skull that lets you fly around. We could see some of the nuanced things that can happen, so we decided to start things off on the first level, Dawn. We ended up getting to this room where there's some boxes here and we flew up through the ceiling, kind of the way that we've known 
ever since Halo 4 speedrunner Zombie showed us the Dawn skip, but apparently more recently there was a new discovery made in Halo 4 that lets you skip the Dawn skip. So it's called the Dawn skip skip, but we don't know how to do it just yet, but we will learn because it probably is a little bit faster than this. Also, we got lost kind of when we got outside of the map. We didn't really know where we were supposed to go. It's a little confusing actually flying outside of the forward onto Dawn, but we did notice that we could load and deload certain sections depending on where we were flying. We made our way to the outside section of the level, then went into the door, and then that triggered a bunch of stuff going on, but we couldn't figure out how to get back inside the map. Then somehow some of us died, but then they respawned in the map, so then all of a sudden we had to make a run for it while everything was exploding. But we did manage to bypass most of the level. I just think we could have done a lot faster. But hey, we were just routing things out for the first time here. Requiem was next, and right away my favorite thing about being in this whole crash site area is that if you fly straight up, you realize you're in this little dome of smoke and fire and as we know the whole area is you know more not debris but it is interesting how they surrounded this opening area with this type of stuff so that it looks like you're in a really big disastrous crash zone but it doesn't bleed to the rest of the map then once we went through the little cave area we got opened up to the big area of the level and honestly this is where it felt like a more traditional acrophobia level we were able to just fly through quickly in the regular way that you get to play and surprisingly enough unlike a lot of the other halo games that have acrophobia now in them, you don't run into as many barriers preventing you from flying slightly outside of the map. You can get stuck a lot easier, but they didn't overdo a lot of these soft barriers keeping you out of certain areas, which made exploration actually a little bit more fun in Halo 4. But this level is just as boring as always, so we just kind of flew through it, got inside, hit the buttons that we needed to do. We then flew to the next part, and then this next area, and we did what we had to do, and we were able to beat this level as well. Okay, so then we get to this level, and it's a little bit interesting here. There are are a lot of directions that you can go, but you're kind of supposed to go a very specific way. Now, we did make sure that we followed the pathway more or less because we didn't want to soft lock anything. We did run into a couple of problems when we were playing through this level where we hit some load too early and then it kind of messed up the rest of the level and it got really confusing where we were versus where we were supposed to be or we thought we we're in the right place, but then things weren't working correctly. It was a little confusing, so we had to slow things down just a little bit, but we still were trying to go as fast as possible. These big open areas, we know you're able to bypass them some way, but we couldn't fully always figure it out. We were able to bypass the first one without too much of a problem getting inside of the building and activating this elevator generator thing. We flew around some more after that. There's a lot of things you can crash into, so you need to be careful. And the game also will teleport players constantly if one player gets too far ahead, but it can be really disorienting, kind of like Combat Evolved almost. When we got to the big open area in the second spot that kind of looks like the first one, we thought we'd be able to just fly out of bounds here. We actually think that's what you're supposed to do in a speed run, but we couldn't figure out how to. So we just quickly flew and blew up the things and went inside and it seemed to be fast enough because we're able just to fly from one to the other. When you get to the big purple area where you could take a ghost if you want to, this can get really, really confusing here because you're kind of in these canyons. And if you fly too high, you can get disoriented very easily, turn back around or you get stuck outside the map or under the map and you're trying to find your way back into the map. And with all three of us just flying in different directions, we were often really confused where we were or we thought we were following someone, but we're really following someone who didn't know where they were going. And it was confusing. Confusing. But we did manage to eventually navigate our way through, getting a little bit better at it. We'll have to run this again in a faster way, but we did start to realize some interesting things here. Because we were going through the level so fast, I think we were kind of messing with some of the loads a little bit. For instance, when we got to the indoor section where you first encounter the didact, we flew around this part and triggered all the loads still that were supposed to trigger, or at least we thought we were, and activated the button without killing all of the enemies. And this cutscene was just really weird. We had this thing with an elite doing some weird stuff while the Prometheans were there. We noticed that the Didact didn't have his normal tractor beam gravity gun type thing on his hand. He just had bare hands doing the force, which was kind of funny. We don't know why this was different. And we also had it earlier when we we're running through where on only my version of the game, my cutscene was completely scuffed and this Promethean just teleported around an extra route or something that wasn't supposed to happen. It looked pretty broken. Then from here we went on to the ghost run and now the ghost run is super interesting comparatively for an acrophobia run we flew through this ghost run and it was actually really fun it was probably more fun than doing an actual ghost run not only do we go fast and it's chaotic and there's a lot of tight barriers and the annoying teleportation every once in a while but it was interesting to see how this level progressively collapses on itself the way that it is designed as you fly through the level it didn't matter that we were going fast everything scales to where that first player is hitting those load sequences and the map 
really does a great job at kind of collapsing, but still making it possible for the slower players to keep up. It's cool, there's some parts that completely will block you off, which are kind of weird, but we did make it all the way through the ghost run, reached the end, and nothing happened. We couldn't trigger the end of the level. So as it turns out, for the end of the level to spawn in, you have to enter a ghost. It does this whole thing with some spawning sequences or death sequences, but we ended up avoiding all that. So Dim and I had to turn around and fly all the way back up the way that we came, but a lot of the route had already collapsed on itself and closed. So us flying backwards was not only confusing because of how like bendy and turny it was and how we had to keep going out of the map to get to the previous section because the place had collapsed on itself, but it's also just disorienting because the loads are weird, these rocks are just out of place, and it's a whole thing. Meanwhile, Luke waited by the gate to see that if once we got into a ghost, it would let him end the level. And surprisingly enough, once Dim and I did finally make our way all the way up to the very top and we jumped into a ghost for a second, it did some loading thing and it automatically let Luke trigger the end of the level. So at the very least, we didn't have to try to fly back again with everything being as broken as it was and we were able to avoid that death penalty timeout thing that's built into the ghost somehow. We'll have to look into this more later on if we decide to take running this seriously. Next, we're going into the grand old forest and this was sad. You think just flying through the trees would be really easy and fun, but no, you fly through a tree for a second and you hit an invisible barrier and you instantly die. It was very tedious. We all died multiple times at the beginning of this level having to restart, but eventually we were more careful and we flew the route we were supposed to and it makes the first part of this level not all that interesting or fun. It's just like going through the walking part, but a little bit faster. We met up with Latsky and the rest of the Marines and then we tried to fly ahead quickly again, but we realized that that's not really an option either as the level won't load correctly. So we are forced to sit there and do this firefight holdout thing for a while, which is so boring. I mean, we just want to fly fast. That's the whole point of acrophobia. So we did the little firefight holdout thing. We flew ahead in the level and then we apparently flew too quickly again because there was no enemies coming into this twig tree cave or whatever this is. And then we couldn't backtrack either because the back half of the level had deloaded. So we had to reload again, do everything correctly, killing all the enemies again, flying forward through. And this time around, the enemies did spawn in here. We were able to take the phantom out really quickly by just using unlimited sticky grenades because we also turned the bandana skull on for this challenge. So that was kind of cool getting to stick a phantom and making it explode. Then from there, we progressed the outside part where normally you're in a tank and we just flew through it. It was kind of fun actually, just avoiding stuff Stuff, trying not to die. There's some weird stuff that happens with some of the rocks and debris, but whatever. We get to the part where you go inside the level and we had to break open this wall and then we flew through the infinity where normally you're supposed to be on a mantis. Uh, we reached the end section and we couldn't open up the door that you normally have to blast open with the mantis. So we had to have one person go all the way back, grab the mantis, which was dim in this case. And then instead of walking the mantis back, there's a load point you can hit that triggers the teammate to teleport up front, which we hit. Dim was able to be closer to the door and he opened up the door for us in which we went outside and we did the whole outside battle just flying around. It was a lot of fun just getting to fly around and not actually having to hold out with a mantis. Eh, different way to play, but definitely a cooler way to play. Okay, so then we were going on to Reclaimer, which is the big level with the mammoth. And now this level, we kind of knew ahead of time that there's a ton of places you can soft lock. So we were trying to be really careful to stay with the mammoth. We did run ahead of the mammoth and we ended up soft locking anyways, which is where the mammoth just despawns because you loaded too much of the level. So instead we had to restart and wait around to make sure that the level was moving up progressively as we went along. Yeah, it was a little bit of a slog. It was mostly played the way you normally would play the level, except we would just kind of fly around and fighting stuff, which made it a little bit more fun. We got to the inside part section. Luke somehow got stuck inside of a wall and we got outside and then we flew over the shield barrier and we were able to finish off this level and we got to look at Virgin Master Chief looking at the explosion. Okay, shutdown is already one of the fastest levels in Halo 4 when it comes to speed running. And interestingly enough, we flew through this level pretty quickly. Shutdown's Pelican flies really fast. We jumped out to see if we could fly faster and quickly learned we could not fly faster than the Pelican. Now, if you didn't know this, this level is actually completely broken because you can fly straight to the final tower and just fly around some geometry and get inside and then skip the whole level pretty much. They never ended up patching that originally when Halo 4 came out. So that's just the way that this level is now. So you can fly straight inside and we tried to fly straight up to the upper area of the level, which there is a trick to do that somehow, so we could skip ahead, but we couldn't seem to get it to work quite right. So we just flew through the level kind of normally, but Dim flew too far ahead or something, and it caused the level at the end not to load correctly, which then caused us a soft lock, so we had to reload and fly normally so we could go over it and then fly to the end and complete the level. So then from there, we were going on to Composer, and this one we thought we could just cruise through 
really quickly. We went way too fast to the beginning straight to where we were supposed to go, which ended us soft locking a bunch of times when we got to where the hunters were. For whatever reason, we would kill the hunters and then just nothing would happen. We tried this a couple of times and still couldn't make any progress. What we ended up having to do was to make sure that we flew through the level partially normally to hit some loads along the way so that everything was flying in in the correct order and then go in to where the hunters were. And once we fought them, the door would then open up after the hunters were killed. We then got to the big outside inside area, flew through some of the hallways some more and just navigated through the level as fast as we could. We probably could have spent a lot of time trying to find little areas to break out of the map because I do feel like this level is pretty vulnerable. But for this first run, we didn't really find anything quite yet that was interesting. At the big open part with the Mantis fight, we pretty much did that normally and then flew to the end of the level. And then there's this wait time at the end of the level that just seems super long for no reason. But we did wait it out and we watched the cutscenes too. Okay, and then we had Midnight, which would be our last level we needed to complete before we could start formulating a plan for actual speedrun attempts. So first things first, we do the flying part pretty normally and it's still really hard to do even 10 years later. Every time the first player crashes, it shakes the screen for the other players, which makes it really confusing. The inside part wasn't all that bad. We just kind of flew ahead and continued along and killed the enemies where we could. They got a little winded at some parts, but it wasn't overtly awful. We did notice at the end fight section where the didact it normally is, you can actually fly straight up to him. And we realized that the didact is just all kinds of weird in this level. Like while Dim was going on and like completing the level, Luke and I just looked at the didact for a while. We noticed you can see his tongue and he has hair clipping through his helmet. Also, is it just me or is the didact super big in this level or this scaling here? I mean, obviously they scaled him to make him look more visible, but I think he's like 10 feet too tall. I mean, he's supposed to be like 11 feet tall in the lore and Master Chief's around what, seven feet? But in this scaling, he's like from the ground to like the knees of the didact. All right, now let's go ahead and shift gears and look at Halo 5 Guardians, which originally released all the way on the Xbox One in 2015. It did get a Forge and Custom Games port on PC, but never had a full dedicated port. It's interesting to talk about one of the few Halos that never actually got re-released in any form. On the mission blue team, you can perform a dead and alive glitch which is where once you get to the part where you have to ride down an elevator, if one person goes down who's not dead, during this time they won't fully bleed out because you're passing through a death barrier, which then in turn ends up making that player invincible at least on the elevator, so you won't die during this time. So essentially, while this is all happening, the game freaks out and it puts you in this perma-down state where you can't do anything other than just thruster and you're gonna be stuck like that, so rest in peace. In Halo 5, if you sit in the mission select screen for like three minutes, for whatever reason, every death barrier for sections where you would go too high or too low in a mission will despawn. So for instance, you could do another glitch like on Meridian Station, you can get a pressure launch done by having these two Marines walking into each other and it'll launch you upwards and you can fall completely out of the map. But since those death barriers are deloaded, you'll end up just falling forever. The Warden Eternal can launch you to some insane heights. If you align yourself with a slanted wall, the Warden has a 33% chance of doing this like shoulder charge attack. And if it's performed correctly, he'll launch you insanely fast upwards. Sometimes the data pads that you can go and collect can cause you to launch while you're in an animation. You have to position yourself in a way where you're not really supposed to be. And when you do the animation that's supposed to make you exit the reading the data pad entry, it'll end up just launching you. Back when Halo 5 Guardians initially released before they patched this one out, there was a series of glitches you could do called ramp slides where you could get insane launches and it was pretty incredible. And the game would just keep your momentum going and you had a lot of opportunities to just go crazy if you wanted to, but once again, this did get patched out. You can do something called an angel jump in Halo 5 by one person meleeing you while you start a ground pound and it'll end up launching the player upwards. You can actually grenade jump in Halo 5 by launching your ground pound attack while a grenade explodes on you. The timing is kind of precise, but yeah, you can get a little bit of a bounce here. On the mission Glast, you can get launched insanely fast from this door. On the same level, if you lodge a warthog into this rising gate here, the game 
game will freak out and send you flying once again. Also, when they added Warzone Firefight to Halo 5, occasionally some players encountered enemies that were carrying a plasma launcher, a weapon that hasn't been in the game since Halo Reach and just randomly showed up here and it doesn't really function correctly even though you can hold it. It later was patched out of the game altogether, but interesting that it just happened to show up. Okay, now let's shift gears to Halo Infinite. Now what's interesting about Halo Infinite is not only is this the newest release in the Halo franchise, but it was the one Halo game we got to start covering as soon as we played Halo during the flights and then we got to cover it after the game released and some of these have ended up becoming patched later on. So this section of the video, kind of like what we just talked about with Halo 5, will include some glitches that have now been patched out but are available if you play the old pre-patch version. Some of these are kind of some unique things that happened even beforehand with like the flights. It's cool because we can't experience those flights anymore. It's not like we can patch back to them, but we did do the best we could back then at compiling all of the glitches that players were encountering way back during those early flight days so we can take a look at them one more time. This first one actually happened to our good friend Dim when he was playing Halo Infinite during one of the play test times and low-key we're kind of jealous because we didn't get a glitch like this to happen directly to us but for whatever reason when Dim loaded up on Bazaar he had this bizarre experience Please don't hate me for that joke. But for whatever reason, it seems like Dim loaded up a version of Bazaar that was chromified. It kind of resembles that futuristic SpongeBob episode, but it looks like for whatever reason, when Dim was loaded in on this map, the entire level loaded without the main textures and lighting effects that typically are supposed to be baked in when you are playing on the game. Now, to be fair, Dim is playing on the OG Xbox One, so the glitch could just be a result of that, or maybe a glitch that only happens on the original Xbox One. But still, we're really glad he clipped this because it is hilarious to look at. I talked about this briefly in our weapon drills video, but I think I can confidently say that for whatever reason, the Ravenger test number one has one too many zeros in the par score expected to get three stars. I mean, it's asking us to get 125,000 points just to get two stars unlocked, which is way more than anything that any of the other weapons have. They're all around 20,000 at the most. I think a couple went up to 25,000, but nothing over over 100,000, and it makes the most sense that going at a fast speed, 12,500 would be the expectation, not 125,000. This one was going on all over Twitter, and literally it's one of the easiest glitches to replicate in the flight, but if you load up on recharge and you have a few dynamo grenades on you, and you throw it at a wet floor sign, it just infinitely duplicates. I have no idea why this happens, but it's absolutely hilarious. And not only did I have a fun time recreating it, but also the amount of clips of people just pushing that glitch to its limit online are pretty funny as well. Now, one thing I did notice though, is it's not really that bad of a glitch. Like after you've done it, all of the wet floor signs start to despawn anyways. So it's one of those glitches I kind of low key hope they don't patch out, but I'm 99.9% .9 sure they are in fact going to patch this one out of the game, but hey, we got to experience it so we can be happy about that. Okay, then during the flight, there was this big custom games glitch, which was really funny. Essentially, if you had one of your friends who was on the lobby in the training grounds and then they invite you to the game and then kick you out of the game, you're just in your own custom games lobby and you can play around with the setting. This actually allowed me to do quite a few different things and discover a few things in Halo that I might not have been able to notice otherwise. The first most interesting one was the game loaded me up on the behemoth map before the map was even added into rotation of multiplayer. So I did get an early sneak peek of the map before everyone else by just a couple of days. A few other people were able to get into the map too. However, in the process of all of this, I did not know that most people hadn't figured out a surefire way to load up in the map and most people just seemed to realize it was a random chance type thing. So in the whole process of this, I just didn't really think much of it. I looked around, I drove a ghost and I drove a warthog and then I wanted to change some settings so I left the lobby and was never able to load up on the map again. I didn't even record any clips from it because I thought, oh yeah, that's just this map will load up if you just do it this glitch this one way. Nope, never was able to get that to happen again, but other people were able to get an early look at Behemoth and then it was made available the Sunday of the first part of the flight. Still, I feel slightly special for being in the smaller percent of players who accessed this level a couple of days early, even though I was just walking around the map completely by myself. Also, this next 
glitch happened to me and a couple of my friends playing on the Xbox as well, but when first loading into the flight, for whatever reason, the weapon switch button wasn't mapped. So for the first couple hours of me messing around in the training grounds and whatnot, I couldn't switch weapons and I was getting really frustrating until I finally realized there was just no key mapped to it for whatever reason, I just had to map it to Y. I don't know how widespread this little glitch was, but it definitely happened to a few of us. Once again, Dim had another glitch happen to him where he just swoops in and steals all of our thunder, getting the cool stuff happening to him. But he was playing a game of capture the flag and the game ended up going into an overtime round. And for the first few seconds, he was in the game like normal until the game just ripped him out of his Spartan and decided to put his camera following a random Spartan. Now, while he's just following this random Spartan, he still was in control of his other Spartan, but he just couldn't see what his Spartan was doing or see the perspective of his Spartan. The player dies and the camera just ends up focusing in on the dead body or where the dead body was. And then eventually Dim's Spartan did end up dying. So Dim fully expected it would end the glitch and he would respawn and be able to continue to play his game of capture the flag, which was in overtime. And nope, his Spartan just respawned somewhere on the map and the camera just stayed focused on the dead body corner. And Dim was just kind of stuck not being able to see what his Spartan was doing. He could shoot and the screen would shake, but that was about it. Doing the custom games glitch was pretty interesting because I was able to change some of the settings like movement speed and jump height, and it did reveal a couple of interesting things along the way about some of the maps. Firstly, these maps are very hard to break out of if there is even a way to break out of them. And then secondly, the detail beyond what you actually see when you're in the map is actually quite a bit lower than what we had expected. A lot of smoke and mirrors is going on in the atmosphere of some of these maps. Now, in general, it's it's been commonplace that once you get outside of a map, you do start to see some of the oddities and weird objects, but never have I had experienced it where we're still in the map and you just jump up higher than normal and you can see outside of the map kind of falling apart. Bazaar, for instance, has all of these buildings just floating right there in the distance. It almost seems like Inception or something is going on on the other side of the city. I also did notice some similar things in the level Live Fire where things look really detailed and polished in the map and then you jump and look around the vicinity and things are a little bit less detailed. Like for instance, this satellite over here is just floating on nothing. I even sprint and tried to jump across the water and land over by the dam. Of course, there's an invisible barrier, but I could see down to the bottom of the dam and there's just no water there or anything. It's just a platform. And even the platform's not fully covering. You can see kind of the bottom of the skybox as well. And I'm kind of mixed on how I feel about this. On one hand, I think it's funny and hilarious and always cool to see kind of the broken edges outside of a map. It's something we've always done in Halo. We've always broken out of maps. We've always seen these crazy things that are kind of put together to make things have a specific appearance, though I didn't expect it to be so easily seen from the inbounds area of the map. Without doing any additional glitches, you can see these visual glitches along the way. Hey, but at the very least, we can at least say that it's a testament of how they're able to pull off these realistic settings and build this atmosphere where you don't notice it unless you have enhanced jumping ability and you're just playing the game exclusively in a basic matchmaking playlist. Another interesting thing that I'm not sure if they're actually going to end up patching out of the game or if it's intended, I'm pretty sure they're going to patch this out, is this button combo glitch where you can punch and switch weapons really quickly, allowing you to do some pretty crazy double punches without any punching cooldown. It's led to some hilarious clips of people just spamming and abusing this punching combo and all you have to do is just spam the punch button, switch weapon, punch, switch weapon, punch, BY, 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 BY and it just goes on infinitely and it's amazing. I also noticed this in the first flight and it seems to have maybe carried over into this fight as well, but sometimes when you change a setting or you press a specific button, the game will immediately unpress or unselect whatever setting you changed. This has happened with my Spartan when I try equipping certain armors. It's also happened when I'm adjusting my settings and then immediately my settings will revert back to what they were beforehand. This also happens frequently in the custom game lobby, which obviously we're not supposed to have access to, but it does also happen in other places in the game too. 
This next one is a glitch Luke somehow noticed in the first flight, and I of course was sure to double check it in this flight, but in Recharge, there's a bunch of these access open boxes throughout the map, and if you punch them, they all break, except for one of them. This one right here, for whatever reason, doesn't break. It didn't break in the last flight, and it still doesn't break in this flight. The community also has found some more interesting things along the way, or just had interesting things happen to them in one way or another. For instance, one of my Twitter followers, Parker Jack, actually sent me this video clip where he was playing and some Spartan just got yeeted up into the ceiling and stuck there and was just kind of hanging in there. Just chilling, hanging out for a bit. I did have this glitch happen on Bazaar where the map just was flickering really randomly in the loading cutscene. It's not as cool as Dim's Chrome Infinite, but still, it was something at least I got to experience. Jerisunder, on the other hand, was playing with some bots and one of them just stopped and stood there to ponder life, to think about things. Or maybe we're at the point where bots are even going AFK nowadays, and if that's already happening, then the singularity is already upon us. Also, Greenalink, who's a speedrunner, found this glitch that randomly happened, where just the screen started flickering all sorts of grays during the little animation that plays out. It's somewhat terrifying, but also kind of interesting. Over on Twitter, Mr. Gibson sent me this clip where when he was playing in the training modes, he ran into these two Spartans that were just clipping inside of each other and chilling. And also YouTuber Wally17 ran into this weird thing where one of the Spartans got stuck halfway in the ground and just glitched out. It kind of felt like one of those old classic Halo 3 type glitches and that's just kind of great. On the warship level, the very first First mission in Halo Infinite. My very first playthrough, I spent way too much time out of bounds accidentally grappling around, getting a feel for it, just trying to explore the area. So coming back to Halo Infinite and just trying this time to purposely explore as much as I could was a really interesting experience. Now before I had kind of just climbed along the side areas, but this time I decided to go up as high as the game would let me as soon as we get into the area where a bunch of the stuff starts to collapse I guess and honestly this is such a great area just to start to get a feel for the grapple hook and getting to just explore the boundaries and one thing that is really interesting about Halo Infinite is that in most of these linear levels you rarely will actually run into one of those soft kill barriers where they just kind of kick you out before you're able to fully explore which of course is something I like it just gives that old vibe of being able to have endless possibilities as to what you can actually explore so I spent a ton of time just walking way up on the highest points of the map just kind of climbing my way up there and then walking on little beams little odds and ends it's interesting when you can kind of stick your head through a texture and see what's on the other side or just kind of walk alongside some invisible geometry and get to look around it's definitely nerve-wracking because you feel like at any point you might just fall off the map and that can be terrifying but it kind of also is part of the adventure side of things after kind of walking around these side areas I wanted to go even higher so I aimed it to try to get up to the ceiling section and eventually with enough climbing and some risky jumps and grapples I did manage to climb my way up to the very top though it may have taken me a couple of tries I did walk along the long structures that are attached to the ceilings which kind of are the highest point you could probably stand and walk around on and it was interesting as I was walking through a tight geometry section where you could walk through some of the textures and continue on I thought I saw something just very briefly and it caught me off guard I didn't know what it was I thought it was a ghost at first or maybe an Easter egg or or maybe actually it kind of made me think it could have been the flood or something just like randomly appearing up there I know that was very unlikely but it just was this very brief second I was like what is that I freaked out a little bit I tried to recreate it as many times as I could and occasionally I got it to pop up again but I couldn't get a good feel for what it was but then when I kind of turned around and rotated backwards and got a wider view of what was going on it was actually just some of the debris that comes out of the ceiling when everything's exploding it looks like this is one of the spawn points for it and it just kind of shoots out of here periodically and it's just like this red stuff that comes out I don't know it's interesting nonetheless though to get a closer look at that now this one's not as much of a grappling hiding spot but it is earlier on in this level and it's something that the speedrunning community has already kind of started looking into and it's really cool now typically when you play through this level you run through a bunch of hallways and then you get to the big engineering room where you have to overload some thrusters and there's a ton of enemies you have to clear all the enemies out but before you even get up to that area, if you go into the room over here and 
punch this specific door three times for whatever reason the door just opens up now you may notice nothing is textured but when you step through the door the entire hallway will then load in and you can run all the way to where the big engine room is this is actually the exit route you take when you leave the engine room although all the lights are turned off when you're running this way and once you get to the door that takes you into the engine room the loading sequence that typically starts when you finish the engine room is triggered and you can bypass everything in the engine room and just run back the way that you just came to make your exit but this time all the lights will turn on all the enemies spawn in and all the explosions and stuff happen but it is a super interesting shortcut and it's just cool to see some of those older odds and ends loading tricks pop up in such a new halo game definitely feels like a game still made in that classic sequential loading style on the next level you have your very first boss fight and at the end of the level there's an elevator you're supposed to take up to the top and I decided to take it upon myself to try to skip this whole last section of the level or just see if I can take a shortcut and avoid using the elevator altogether using the grapple hook to climb now in the first two levels you can't upgrade your grapple hook at all so you have to just use the default recharge and stuff which makes climbing upwards way harder than what I'm able to do in the rest of the levels but after a while I did get a feel for how I had to kind of pull the Spartan backwards away from the upwards pull so that I would get the most up momentum but also be able to rehook on at a higher angle than where I'm actually close to it sounds complicated but once you get a vibe for it you can get into the rhythm of just climbing up and making upwards speed with this default grapple hook and I climbed and I climbed and I climbed and right when I thought I was getting close to the top because there was this black ceiling and I hit my head on an invisible barrier that blocks you right here at the top point of the elevator. It was a little disappointing, but still, it was really fun to get a feel for climbing. The elevator shaft that you're not supposed to go up to is kind of cool. On the conservatory, I did manage to try to climb up as high as I could in this section to just see if I could maybe get a look outside of those windows. Now, this area was really great for practicing grappling and just using the grapple hook to get a lot of forward momentum. And it's a big open space that's a lot of fun to climb up in. However, the really disappointing part was as badly as I wanted to see what was outside those windows, pretty obvious that they didn't intend on anyone even going up in this section. I did eventually hit my head on an invisible ceiling, like 70% of the way up to the top of the room. So unfortunately, we won't get a closer look at that window just yet, but still it was kind of cool to get a good look of this area from a very high angle and then just get to free fall back down. Now, later on, on the spire, I pretty much did the exact opposite of what I got to do in the conservatory, where instead, in this instance we ride a grav lift up and I decided to try to use my grapple hook to fling myself back down the grav lift and surprisingly enough this was actually somewhat effective where the pull of the grapple hook is stronger than the push of a grav lift so I was able to kind of force my way back down the grav lift quite a bit now you do get a little glimpse of a room area down here however it does look like there's hard barriers stopping you from trying traveling outside of the cylinder of the grav lift. So as much as I wanted to pull myself into those rooms, I could only grapple hook them to pull myself further down, not actually to yank myself out of the grav lift. And I was able to descend all the way down into this large room. And overall, this whole area was actually really cool looking. There wasn't too much to it, but it still was cool just that there was this area that most players won't even really look at other than just a few seconds they're going up the grav lift that I was able to take a slower moment and enjoy the sights of a little bit longer. Also in general on the spire this level has some really high ceilings so you can kind of grapple your way up and just skip some sections or skip some enemies by just chilling up on these upper areas. There's not really too much of a point to it but I did think it was fun getting up this high and then later on in the level you get to this big large wide open room and usually you have to wait a few seconds before the light bridge comes out and I was like nah I'm just gonna grapple my way around the room and see what happens I ended up just grappling onto the side of this large square room and eventually could make my way up even to the ceiling to grapple up there if I wanted to or just stay alongside the side walls I definitely died quite a few times messing around in this room and trying to get a feel for how much I could explore but I was pleasantly surprised to find that I could pretty much go to any area in this section of the map that I wanted to firstly I wanted to go check out those large gold windows that have the light just pouring in from 
from it. It just looks so cool. And I was able to grapple over there. There's not too much going on in here, but it is a cool room to say that you're able to get inside of. But after chilling in this area for a little bit, I grappled back into the middle of the room. And real quick, I wanted to see if I could climb up the elevator shaft here early before triggering the button. And unfortunately you can't, there's a hard barrier plugging this up at the top, but it is funny as soon as you drop down and press the button, you just go right back up the elevator. But by far one of my favorite ones that I discovered in my playthrough of just exploring odds and ends of Halo Infinite was the level Nexus. Now typically in this level, there's this long gondola ride that you go on and it kind of takes you through this big door that opens up, kind of reminds you of Halo 2 a little bit, and then you just carry on after you get off the gondola. But I was just wondering, since I've now kind of managed to get a really good feel on grapple alongside walls and continuously grappling for a long time. What if we took that to the next level and try to skip the gondola all together? And actually, this was a bit of a bigger process than maybe I initially thought it would be. It started off with me just trying to get a feel for grappling around the room and seeing if there was invisible barriers, which at first I actually thought there was, but I ended up getting past it, so there wasn't. But in general, having to grapple continuously for a very long time without having a landing point is pretty challenging. And in this wide open room, I did struggle a bit until I started to get a feel for it. I did find occasionally little sentinel entrance areas or spawn holes in the wall. I don't know what to call these things that I could stand on and get a better feel for the room. But eventually this would be a section that I would have to grapple continuously through if I was going to actually make my way alongside it. So as I was just grappling ahead to where the big door was, I wanted to see if I could actually stand on the door that opens up. And while it seemed like I was kind of clipping through the door, I made my way back around only to find the door actually opened up when my character got close enough to the door. So then began the whole process of trying to grapple my way back to go through the door, which if you actually go too low, you'll end up dying because there's a kill barrier about halfway through the door. And I tried to grapple through that and get to the other side, which was, oddly enough, a pretty good success. But then I knew I had to try to make my way all the way over to where the gondola typically stops. So the grapple game continued. It was really, really challenging because the ceilings actually change in height periodically as you progress section to section, which ends up making it a lot easier to slip up and overestimate how far your grapple can actually go. And then you have those heartbreaking deaths. And I died a lot here just trying to get a feeling for what I was able to do in this area. But eventually, sure enough, I did manage to continuously keep a grapple going and work my way alongside those ceilings before I finally landed and touched down on the next bridge section where the gondola typically lands. And interestingly enough, when I landed there, I was given the cue to progress the level normally, so I just continued as if I had gotten off the gondola even though I'd never rode the gondola to begin with. And right after that room, we're greeted to another massive room that I spent a ton of time exploring. Besides the fact I love the way that they scaled these larger than life structures in Halo Infinite, almost respecting Halo Combat Evolves architecture and then things that are introduced later on in Halo 2. I love the fact I can just go explore areas I'm clearly not supposed to go and I began my work grappling alongside the walls just bypassing this whole section that I'm supposed to be in and I decided to go all the way down to the left of this large enclosed space and while it was tricky to maneuver through this and there's not very many things you can stand on to try to catch your breath and get a checkpoint or something like that, eventually I did make my way all the way to the end wall and there's this little lookout window that's here that is likely just for aesthetic so when you look both directions on the bridge you can not only see something in the distance but it actually is placed only on one side of this area and not both sides likely to make the area asymmetrical so if you get spun around or something happens like that you don't get confused which direction you're going you can remember that there was a light on the left side not on the right side it is actually a really small detail that I think was really cleverly made though I saw so badly wanted to get into this little balcony room and I just could not get in there for the life of me. But hey, it's cool that it still exists. Then I decided to grapple my way all the way back, then begin my grappling challenge to the opposite side. And of course there's no little balcony window lookout area over there. And it actually is just a curved wall. And that threw me off so badly because I kept feeling like I needed to continue on, but I was so focused on keeping the grapple going that I never really realized that I was turning with the 
wall and I would get turned around and I would see the bridge in front of me and think that I spun myself around, but it really was just me following the wall. It's confusing, but still, it was a cool big open area to explore. Now, one interesting thing is right after all of that, when I decided to progress in the level, my game soft locked, hard locked. I'm not really sure what to call this. So I had full reign to look around and move. So my game wasn't completely frozen, but nothing else worked at all. And I was just stuck like that infinitely. So I ended up having to restart the game. And when I restarted the game and loaded in, it didn't give me any of my checkpoints from when I was just grappling around and exploring. It put me all the way back to the beginning section of the gondola. From there, I rode the gondola normally and that seemed to fix the problem. So I think somehow, while some loading parts still work normally, if you decide to leave the gondola behind and not play the game sequentially like you're supposed to, you might run into a problem like this where the game ends up locking itself. Okay, on Nexus, there's also this tunnel slide thing that you get to slide down, which definitely is a cool throwback, I think, to Halo 2. But not only is it fun just to free fall and ride down the slide, I'm sure many of us took it upon ourselves to try to climb our way back up the drop down. And of course, that was immediately what I wanted to try to do. I climbed up the entire thing and about midway up the climb, you actually realize there's a fork in the road, despite it being really dark and you're grappling your way up and you can't really see where you're going. If you go back up the normal way that you fell down, you can make your way all the way back up to the room you started in, and then you can do the whole slide again, though no easter egg or anything cool happens. And then if you grapple your way back up and take the dark path going up where the fork is, you can continue to climb up for a little ways before you hit a ceiling that blocks you from going any further. Also, there's this big entrance way that you go into by rising up a grav lift here, and I wanted to explore the structure of it, even though I knew there probably wouldn't be too much I could go and actually see, but it still was fun swinging around the outside area of this and just looking at this entrance way that's used in a vertical format. It's just something that's kind of neat to look at even though you can't just bring yourself to the end of the level using the grapple hook, you have to actually ride up the lift itself. There's also a few other spots from Infinite's campaign that I found interesting, even if I couldn't really go too far out of bounds on them. Like on Repository, for instance, there's this large elevator shaft that you go up and I wanted to see how high up I could climb. And this time around, it was a little different than some of the other structures we've run into where we get blocked off by a hard barrier. There actually wasn't a barrier stopping us from climbing higher. It was just a trait zone preventing me from using my grapple hook after I hit a certain height in the level. So that was just interesting because it was different from anything else where, where typically we would hit a barrier. In this case, I just couldn't grapple hook. The ability was just turned off or whatever. And then on the final level, there's a couple of sections that are a little bit interesting to fly around and grapple upon. There's this big wide open blue room, which is kind of like one of the areas we saw earlier on. And you can kind of grapple around a bit. There is interestingly enough an invisible ceiling not letting you get too high and if you go too far this way we have a soft kill barrier which isn't something we see too often in the linear campaign levels though once again if you go all the way out to the side it looks like there is in one of these instances one of those balcony type areas and it may actually be accessible there are a lot of sections in this level where you do stand in a window kind of looking off without going into spoilers so it is cool that in this one you might actually get to go inside them but it is interesting to see how the use of this space is different in this level this time around also at the very end before you go to the final boss fight there is an elevator ride that you typically ride and some cutscene stuff goes down and i decided to try to grapple my way up to the top to see if it would let me go up there and actually this time around there wasn't a barrier stopping me from climbing all the way up this blue elevator it looks cool with the blue rings or whatever and once i got to the top i realized yeah you can't progress unless you uh, get the elevator. So you have to jump back down and you have to take the elevator to get that last door to open. So you're still kind of stuck, but it was fun getting to make my way up an elevator shaft that actually led to something. Okay, now while I was working on trying to find some interesting places to navigate in the more linear sections and Luke was grinding his way at getting this video edited, we decided to send Dem off on his own little task to just go out in the open world and see what happens. Now mind you, this footage is Dem rocking the Xbox from 2013, which is his preferred console of choice. But Dim did manage to find out that if you navigate over to this section of the map, you can kind of go down into some rocks and there's kind of just a clear area you can use with the wasp and get out of bounds. 
Essentially, you get full access to the complete underbelly of this area, and while you can't fully go anywhere you want without running into a soft kill barrier, it's still really interesting to see the Halo ring from this type of perspective. And besides Dim randomly blowing up out of nowhere, he was really, really excited to report back to us that he did manage to kill a single grunt through the bottom of the map shooting through the surface. So that was kind of cool. Now I think this is just the tip of the iceberg for all that Halo Infinite has to offer as far as little explorative areas that aren't intentional for players to find. Obviously there's the easter eggs that are put there like the easter egg spoiler alert giant sandwich hidden in the caves or the Craig tour on top of the tower but I think finding some of the areas that maybe aren't as black and white intentional are just as cool too. Okay if you made it this far into the video without like skipping ahead kudos to you for watching three hours of just some of the coolest halo glitches that we've experienced over the years and we've been able to compile it's been a lot of fun getting to look at a game frame franchise like Halo and still have quite a bit planned for the future but we'll also be setting our sights on some new endeavors beyond just Halo that we're excited about. We appreciate your enthusiasm about video games so if you enjoyed this video and you want to see more of our content whatever that may be make sure you're subscribed with notifications on. A huge huge shout out to our patrons who've been supporting this channel for such a long time thank you so much but otherwise that's it for today we'll see you guys all next time with a brand new video.